During the Second World War, one U.S. Army Infantry Division repeatedly proved itself as America's finest. I saw many men killed and wounded on that beach. Leading the way into action in Africa, Italy, and on to bloody Omaha Beach. They were dropping hand grenades on us. They were throwing mortars in on us. The water was red with blood. Lightly armed GIs who stood their ground against Hitler's best SS panzers. We didn't think we were going to last. I think that was as scared as I was. They are the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One. An extraordinary war demanded extraordinary soldiers. Well, we were good. We were very good. The best there was. Forged into elite bands of brothers. You were fighting for your buddy. You didn't want to let them down. By facing the trials of war together. They attacked us up through the vapor trails and butchered us up pretty good. These are the stories of the Second World War's most famous fighting formations and their journey through tragedy and triumph. The German commander said, I've never seen any people as brave as yours. To earn their battle honors. Sunrise on the 6th of June, 1944, D-Day. Off Omaha Beach, Normandy, thousands of men from the US 1st Infantry Division approach as a massive Allied bombardment hits the shoreline ahead. One of my men came to me and he said, Sergeant Reynolds, do you think we're gonna make it through this one? And I told him I was just as concerned as he was. They are the first wave in the huge amphibious assault to liberate Nazi-occupied Europe, a turning point in the war. The men of the 1st Division, known as the Big Red One, are already veterans. But now they face a virtually impossible mission. Layers of barbed wire, countless mines, and a deadly hail of machine gun fire raining down from the cliffs above. They felt that it'd just be a cakewalk for us on Omaha Beach. This will be one of the bloodiest days in American history. And the men of the Big Red One are front and center. The 1st Infantry Division of the United States Army was founded on the 24th of May, 1917, as America prepared to enter the First World War. And in October, they are the first US soldiers to fight against the Kaiser. They were on the front line throughout the campaign from 1917 on, and I think they gained a reputation as being uh, one of the best, if not the best, division in the U.S. Army during World War I. They suffered heavy losses, but won respect as a fierce combat unit, the Fighting First. They had also gained another nickname based on their distinctive shoulder patch, the Big Red One. A lot of the soldiers felt that because they had the number one on their uniforms, they had to live up to the fact that they were number one. And again, they led the way into America's war with Hitler. The reputation of the Big Red One is of an aggressive infantry unit that, that is always at the forefront of whatever uh, overseas action uh, America chooses to, to take part in. 
On the 1st of August, 1942, they sailed for Europe under the command of Major General Terry Allen. Hard drinking, scruffy, uncaring about his appearance, but you know, aggressive, belligerent, very much became the persona of the Big Red One. He was a fighter. He was very courageous. He was gutsy. You never knew what Terry was going to do uh, once he was faced with a combat situation. Even the most intense battlefield training in Britain could only partly prepare them for the horrors ahead. Fighting as an infantryman is personal. You don't do your killing or your dying from a long way away. You've got to meet your enemy and defeat them whilst you're able to smell their breath. It also means acceptance of casualties, of the brutality of combat. It builds up uh, a real sense of comradeship with the men around you because, you know, your life truly does depend on them and vice versa. They were organized as a triangular division with three infantry regiments totaling around 14,000 men. Each supported by artillery, engineering, medical, and tank battalions. In October 1942, the Big Red One departed for their first real action. The Allied amphibious invasion of North Africa, Operation Torch. The Allies' plan was to launch an invasion by air and sea that would force the Axis out of North Africa and provide a launch pad for the liberation of Southern Europe. On the 8th of November, the Big Red One led the way into Algeria. Under fire from the colonial Vichy French troops, clients of the Nazis. I went in with the assault troops. I was a junior officer and I was expendable, I guess. It was the first time that I had been exposed to enemy fire. In some chaos, they pushed towards their objective, the town of Oran. By and large, we were disorganized. It was an all new game to us. We learned to throw away the book at that point. And by the time we reached the outskirts of Iran, we were beginning to settle down. But to capture Iran, they had to fight their way through stiff, Vichy opposition in two days of combat. Major General Allen then addressed his victorious troops. You have won your objective and have acquitted yourselves in a most creditable manner. I wish to extend my deep appreciation and to pay homage to our gallant dead and to our sorely wounded. It was a morale-boosting early victory for the Big Red One, and Operation Torch was a resounding Allied success. The division's lead unit was the 16th Infantry Regiment. Benjamin Hilton is vice president of the regiment's historical society. In front of us, we've got two original field jackets from the Second World War. This particular jacket is the M1941 field jacket, which was worn by a first division veteran. This particular jacket was made in a uh, lighter sort of khaki color. As the war progressed, they were made in a sort of darker green. The M1941 field jacket it wasn't a particularly well-designed jacket. It wasn't particularly practical. There was only a couple of pockets in there which weren't ideal for transporting things. It was uh, eventually replaced by the uh, M1943 field jacket, which was much more practical design. It had four large external pockets. They do fit a K-ration box perfectly, which is a lot more useful. It was made of a windproof cotton, so it would retain the heat a lot better in more extreme climates. And it was just much more well received by the troops, mainly because of the additional storage space they had. You just have to remember that these guys were living out of their pockets for weeks on end. 
The first division patch is obviously the iconic big red one. The legend says that when the division adopted the patch in 1918, that the uh, troops were cutting the red one out of cloths off the field caps from German dead and prisoners. The Big Red One continued their advance into Tunisia. The Vichy French had offered little resistance. But now they came up against battle-hardened German soldiers. The Africa Corps. Commanded by the fearsome Erwin Rommel. This would be their first real test. In early 1943, Rommel planned a swift counterattack. He wanted to stop the Allied advance, splitting his forces in two. He would strike through the hills, using the Kazarin Pass to outflank the Allies, including the first. On the 19th of February, the 21st Panzer Division launched a surprise attack. The plan was to push his armored forces through the Kasserim Pass and to hit the Americans before they were prepared and give them a bit of a hiding in what would be their first major battle with the Germans. Initially, the Allies held. But then Rommel added two more armored divisions to the attack, forcing a disorganized retreat that included the fighting first. German panzer forces, in effect, caused a panzer fright, as they used to call it. And so the Americans, who were inexperienced, really struggled to cope with their vastly more experienced foes. Having advanced almost 80 kilometers, Rommel's panzers were halted by the appalling weather, rocky terrain, and Allied reinforcements, who unleashed a massive artillery barrage forcing an Axis retreat. By the 25th of February, Allied forces had retaken the corpse-strewn Kazarin Pass and all the lost ground. The two sides ended where they had started, at the cost of around 1,000 Axis and over 6,000 Allied casualties, including more than 240 lost in just one battalion from the first. Their advance now continued through Tunisia. Until dawn on the 23rd of March, when stopped by an artillery barrage at the desert oasis of El Guttar. Here, they met an old foe from the Kazarin Pass, the 10th Panzer Division, whose troops quickly overran their lines. Two Panzers approached Major General Allen's divisional headquarters, but getting out of the way was the last thing on Allen's mind. I will, like hell, pull out, and I'll shoot the first bastard who does. When the Germans attacked, the Big Red One just refused to yield. It refused to give ground, and it met the Germans and took them on. They unleashed a maelstrom of anti-tank and artillery fire, destroying 30 panzers. Big Red One's success at Al-Gitar was a very big deal because it was the first time in the war that American troops, and the, the Big Red One in particular, had met German panzer forces and beaten them. The first division, I think, proved to the Germans, if to no one else, that the Americans were going to be a force to be reckoned with. The Big Red One honed their combat skills for over three months until May, when a quarter of a million Axis troops surrendered. The North African campaign was over. 
but their newly won reputation would quickly push them back to the front line. Once again, front and center for the invasion of Europe through Italy. To remove Mussolini and alleviate pressure on the Eastern Front, helping Soviet Russia. It would start with Sicily. US forces were led by firebrand General George S. Patton. He had his own unique way of declaring his hard-won respect for the bloody first. I want those sons of bitches. I won't go without them. Patton really was counting on Terry Allen and the 1st Division to lead the American charge once they got to Sicily. Tenth of July, 1943. The big guns of the US and Royal Navies unleashed a massive bombardment of the port of Giella. As the men of the Big Red One approached the shore, their aim was to capture the Ponte Olivo airfield, eight kilometers inland from Giella, and do it quickly. They fought their way across the beach against fascist Italian troops. Giella fell. But as they advanced on the airfield, the defenders mounted a ferocious counterattack to retake Jella, backed by the awesome firepower of a unique Panzer division. The Hermann Goering Panzer division were a strange unit. They were paratroopers equipped with tanks. It married up veteran Fallschirmjäger, some of Nazi Germany's most successful, most determined troops, with their panzers. And, and, and that made for, uh, you know, really an elite. As they quickly proved, punching through the first's front line, until stopped by a naval bombardment and Allied airstrikes. This massive fire support helped them force the panzers into a retreat. Finally, on the 12th of July, almost 27 hours later than planned, the Big Red One secured Ponte Olivo. It had been the heaviest fighting they had seen so far. But they now faced a challenge on a whole new scale. A fortified mountaintop town, Troina, defended by two divisions. To take Troina was to break the German defensive line. They had to launch a massive assault. And then it was down to hand-to-hand, house-to-house -to -house fighting. And the first division runs into one hellacious storm of artillery fire, machine gun fire. It took six brutal days under constant Axis counterattacks to take Troina, causing several hundred more casualties for the division. An often miserable recuperation only found some modest relief through the impressive postal links home. So here I've got a few letters and postcards from a private Joseph Carmine Santaniello. He was actually awarded the Silver Star at Troina. Um, it's essentially what happened was he'd been seriously wounded in, in combat and he was returning to the aid station when he observed his company trying to withdraw uh, and they were pinned down under fire. So Joseph went back to a good firing position and provided a little bit of cover to his troops trying to withdraw to allow them to safely maneuver out of uh, harm's way. And so after the Battle of Troina, he uh, had this postcard, which would have been written probably while he was recuperating from his injuries, addressed it to his daughter. He'd written it on August the 28th, 1943. I hope when you get this card, it will find you in the best of health. As for me, I'm in the best of health. So until I hear from you, love and kiss to mother, your dad. 
I sure miss you, dear. Very much. Love, Dad. You do find a lot of these letters that men won't really reveal the extent of what they're going through. They try, it's almost like they're trying to shelter their families from, you know, the true horror of what they're having to live through on a daily basis. For Joseph to essentially enter the war in North Africa, fight right through to the end into Czechoslovakia and survive with only obviously one injury is very, very, very rare. For example, the division when they invaded in Normandy, a lot of the men were replacements because they took such a battering in Sicily. During the war, the first suffered more than 20,000 casualties, requiring constant replacements. These new men, usually totally inexperienced, often faced a tough ride against the cynical veterans who now depended on one another instinctively. Following the liberation of Sicily, the first returned to Britain, now led by Major General Clarence Hubner, himself promoted from the ranks. He was a crusty old soldier, a real disciplinarian, kind of in the mold of Patton. There were a lot of officers and enlisted men who did not like his style. He had them go through basic training all over again. Bales, bales, we've been killing Germans for months now, and they are teaching us to shoot a rifle? It doesn't make any sense. They had to be ready for another first, now leading the way to liberate North Europe. D-Day. Because of their experience, they were chosen as the lead division to land at Omaha Beach. A hellish six-kilometer stretch of the Normandy coastline. But led by veteran sergeants such as Harley Reynolds, still just 19. I was in the first wave with a special assignment on the invasion of North Africa. And I was in the first wave with special assignment on the invasion of Sicily. And uh, they felt that we were experienced enough that we'd make this one. It'd, it'd just be a cakewalk or a walk-on for us on Omaha Beach. We rehearsed continuously. We were crawling over the sides of boats on rope ladders down into landing craft and storming beaches in England before we participated in the actual invasion at Omaha Beach. So we've got in front of us here the uh, American assault jacket. When they came ashore, the equipment that they were wearing, the idea was that this would really help them by carrying the essential kit they needed. One of the good features was the quick release uh, tabs where essentially it was designed so if you had to get the jacket off in a hurry, you pull those and it could be taken off in a matter of seconds. There's two small pockets for frag grenades. Uh, they carry their shelter half in the back, uh, toilet articles. Here we've got the American M1910 bayonet. The idea was on D-Day that these weapons were to provide some real up close and personal support because when you're clearing trenches or bunkers or enemy positions, you need something that you, you know, you're gonna rely on if you do come face to face with an enemy soldier. The D-Day plan was for the Big Red One to land east of the very inexperienced 29th Infantry Division on Omaha Beach, the toughest job on D-Day. A whole stretch of open sand, totally overlooked by high bluffs where the Germans had located their defensive positions. Heavy machine guns, mortars, anti-tank guns. Many would land in the LCVP, Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel, or Higgins Boat. Named for their designer, Andrew Jackson Higgins. Their shallow draft got up to 36 troops close to the shore, but not over Omaha's notorious sandbanks or deadly obstacles. With over 23,000 produced, they were one of the engineering miracles that powered the Allies to victory. On 
On the evening of the 5th of June, thousands of men from the 1st Infantry Division left for France. Around 0300 hours on the 6th, they dropped anchor 22 kilometers off the coast and waited. I didn't know what fear was. I knew I was frightened, but I was also excited. I was on a British troop ship, and the last meal on the American ship was steak and eggs. We had macaroni and cheese on this British troop ship, macaroni and cheese. That was our last meal before we hit Omaha Beach. The small Higgins boats were tossed around in the rough seas so far from shore. They are being seasick over the side, into their helmets, and thinking that their only release from that would be into the, into the teeth of German machine gun fire. And that must have been just terrifying. Overhead, hundreds of bombers devastated the shoreline. Followed by battleships and cruisers. We were sitting out there, the bombers going over, the ships firing on the beaches. Such awesome firepower. The bombers had bombed too far inland, so they killed a lot of Norman cows, but left virtually all of the defenses untouched. The same thing happened with the Navy. They were supposed to knock out the concrete bunkers that were there. They, too, overshot the mark. The Allies had made another big mistake. Failing to spot the arrival of the German 352nd Infantry Division close to Omaha Beach. Our intelligence was fooled on that beach. The Germans outdid us on that one. They slipped a whole division of German troops on that beach that we didn't know about. Now when we got to the beach, they're waiting for us. There was explosions, so they were just going right down the line. See, the four boats were coming in, and they were just going right down the line. And the machine guns would traverse, and you could hear the machine gun bullets going off the ramp. One of my men was beginning to sort of lose it. And uh, he came to me and he said, Sergeant Reynolds, do you think we're going to make it through this one? We've been through a lot of them and the odds are going to catch up with us somewhere. And I told him I was just as concerned and as he was. The Germans were traversing, hitting all the boats coming in. And we weren't about to go out the ramp, but before we could go over the side, the boat was blown up. I remember an explosion. I remember the boat going up and over, and that's all I remember. I said to my guys, I'm going over the side. This is life or death, and I'm going over, and I'm going over the right side because most of the fire was coming from that angle. And there was pieces of body everywhere, and you had to wade through them, and uh, that part of the beach, was, the water was red with blood. And it's a terrible, terrible thing to even talk about. Everybody dumped their packs to get out of the water and be able to run and stuff. And then you would try to time the machine gun fire so that you could make a few steps and dive between them and hope it missed you and get as low as you could. And you wanted to get that three or 400 yards from the edge of the water up to the beach. And that looked like three miles. Within the first hour, some of the Big Red One's units had suffered heavy casualties. I saw many, many men killed and wounded on that beach while we're uh, held up there. I was scared, but you don't want to act scared in front of your buddies. You know, the, you know this stuff, apple pie and ice cream and democracy, that's crock and bull. We infantry guys, you were fighting for your buddy, the guy on the right and the left of you. That's, that's, you didn't want to let them down. Colonel Taylor, commanding the 1st Division 16th Infantry Regiment, started to rally the survivors. There are two kinds of people who are staying on this beach. Those who are dead and those who are going to die. 
Now let's get the hell out of here. Terry Allen uh, had a motto for the division, which was nothing in hell must stop the 1st Infantry Division. And he drove that into the men's heads until they were convinced that they could overcome anything that the enemy might throw at them. I made the shingle embankment on the very first run with about 80 pounds of ammunition and equipment without stopping. And my men were right with me. As soon as you got up there, they were dropping hand grenades on us. They were throwing mortars in on us. One of the English ships, somebody relayed the coordinates to him so they knew how to send their shells in. They started to help us. And you'd hear, and then it would land up on top. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here today. Allied destroyers virtually beached themselves a few hundred meters offshore in order to target the German gun emplacements on the cliffs. They took six hours to get to the top. There were barbed wire entanglements, minefields. It was a very difficult, close run thing. It took until noon to secure most of the beach, but more bloody hours to clear the cliffs. By the end of the day, the Allies had established a beachhead. But the fighting first alone had suffered over 1,200 casualties. Thousands of boys were lost that day at, at Omaha Beach. It was the worst place in the world to go in. For the next month, progress was slow as they fought through the thick bocage hedgerows of Normandy. And that was a new kind of battle for us, six or seven feet high and stuff growing in the middle of it. And you'd be in one and think you're safe and just then they'd come over that hedgerow and you're almost nose to nose with your enemy there. And they knew where we were and we didn't know where they were. So that was a bad experience, but again, because of our great small arms, we probably got out of a lot of those without getting killed because we had the better small, small arms. Here we've got the US M1 rifle, which entered service with the US Army in the late 1930s. It's a semi-automatic rifle in 306 caliber, holds about eight rounds in these little end block clips. It really gave the Americans a good edge over the German military because they had much better firepower. What's quite interesting is that the 16th Infantry Regiment were used to trial these canvas slings, which replaced the earlier leather 1907 sling. The later canvas sling was cheaper to produce, it was easily manufactured, and it's easily adjustable by this small tab. What we've come across through memoirs, through interviews, even official combat reports, is that the men absolutely loved this weapon. They thought it was fantastic. It was just so reliable and so well loved by the troops. Apart from their rifles, the infantry's only major firepower came from mortars and a punchy, heavy machine gun, which was over 20 years old. The M1919 was a 30 caliber belt-fed machine gun, about a meter long and weighing 14 kilos. It was relatively lightweight and versatile, while still packing a punch. It proved extraordinarily reliable, working even in the worst conditions. And by 1945, production exceeded 430,000. At the end of July, they swapped the hedgerow barriers for piles of rubble as they blasted their way through Marigny to help take saint lô The town itself had taken an absolute beating from Allied air power and really had been devastated, but that made it a lot easier for the defenders who turned every wrecked house into a strong point, and so the big red one had to to fight through almost inch by inch.
For over two harsh months after D-Day, the first had battled the unexpectedly tough resistance in Normandy before helping to force a Nazi retreat. By September 1944, they reached the German city of Aachen and the next barrier to the Nazi heartland, the fearsome defenses of the Siegfried Line. Anti-tank ditches, pillboxes, dragon's teeth, machine gun nests. This is where the Americans were looking to force a breach so they could get into Germany as quickly as possible and end the war. The Big Red One are now given another tough assignment, to storm the heavily defended high ground overlooking Aachen. The aim of the operation was to bring observed fire down onto Aachen itself uh, and to try and force the German defenders into, into submission. Unfortunately, it didn't work like that. We were given the mission of maintaining the ridge, and they threw everything they had at us. We were there for 39 days. Fighting the relentless German counterattacks that tried to retake the high ground and destroy their artillery. On the 10th of October, General Hubner delivered an ultimatum to the Germans. Which, in effect, said, surrender or we will bomb you to oblivion. Ah! Unfortunately, the German commander decided not to surrender. So the Allies unleashed over 5,000 shells on the city. As aircraft rained death, But the Nazis fought on. They launched a major attack against us. It was a fierce battle that was only saved by the fact that we had the core artillery. The Allied onslaught continued for more than a week. The fighting for Aachen was brutal. They were using 105 millimeter and even 155 millimeter artillery pieces, which are very, very big pieces of kit to destroy individual machine gun nests, to kill individual snipers, until, you know, with very few of them left, they eventually surrendered. We cleaned them out house by house, street by street, till on the 21st of October, Aachen, or what was left of it, surrendered. But the cost of the first was immense, suffering more than a thousand casualties. Victory in Aachen was symbolically hugely important because it was the first major German city to fall to the Anglo-Americans. So no longer could Hitler and the Nazis tell their populace that they were keeping the enemy beyond the frontiers. Now just five kilometers inside Nazi Germany, the Big Red One faced a nightmare of epic proportions, a slaughter that would cost them more than six and a half thousand casualties, blasting through an extraordinary natural barrier and perfect defensive position, the Hertgen Forest. The forest you might find in a grim fairy tale. It was just dark and gloomy. Everything is constantly wet. We were used to going to bed at night and or in a tent or something. All at once, you don't have anything to sleep under. You don't go to bed because you're on patrol or the patrol's on you. There are hidden machine gun emplacements everywhere. There's no night and there's no day. It's just constant warfare. The Germans would lob in artillery shells that would hit the top of the trees, creating what's called an air burst. And so the shrapnel would beat down on the soldiers from above. Infantry's not a good place to be if you want to be in a war. 
The fighting first bled in the Hurtgen forest for three weeks until the 7th of December, 1944, when they were finally allowed to refit and rest. They had been under fire for nearly six months. We had been on the front line for 171 days. So they come up and told us, get your platoons together, what's left on you. Platoon should have a 42 men and you're down to about 15 to 20. And uh, they said, they're gonna take us back to Verviers, Belgium. We're gonna get hot showers, we're gonna get clean clothes, we're gonna have a hot meal. Most studies at the time found that infantrymen would become degraded after kind of 40, 45 days of combat. It was a tired and almost kind of hollowed out division in some ways, you know, come the end of 1944. The Big Red One desperately needed proper rest to recover. But Hitler had other plans. They came by and said, Lucky, get the guys up, we're going back up. I got all the guys up and we went back up and never got off the line again, so that was it till the war ended. On the 16th of December, the Nazis launched a surprise counterattack with 30 divisions into the forested Ardennes region of Belgium. Now known for the shape it punched into the Allied front line, the Battle of the Bulge. Basically, it was throwing all of the infantry and armored divisions that the Germans had left on the Western Front against the American lines. Many of the American units that were on the west side of that bulge crumbled. But the first division just would not yield. They fought the Germans tooth and nail. They did everything in their power to prevent the Germans from, from breaking through. It was remarkable that the First Division was able to withstand the onslaught that the Germans kept throwing at them. In the worst winter for years, these bold infantrymen engaged General Zepp Dietrich's elite SS panzers near the Belgian town of Buchtenbach. Terribly cold conditions. They were struggling to get resupplies of ammunition, of food, of water. Amidst all of that, they're being attacked by pretty much the best troops the Germans have at that stage of the war. Even for men who had survived the horrors of Omaha Beach, the Battle of Buchenbach set a new standard for ferocity. We didn't think we were going to last really, with the shelling and everything and the way they were attacking, and we had no air cover. I think that was as scared as I was. First Division got slaughtered again in the Belgian bulge in the Ardennes. We lost a lot of men. And they said, you know, nothing that we have experienced thus far was as difficult as the fighting was during the Battle of the Bulge. But it paid off. Hitler's desperate last offensive in the West broke on the Allies' stubborn defiance. The role of infantry in any conflict is to take and hold ground. It is up close and personal. But to take ground, you often have to cross rivers. And the first now faced one of Europe's biggest, the Rhine. The Rhine is fast flowing and it is hundreds of meters wide. You have to have a bridge of some sort. The Nazis had already blown most of the Rhine bridges, but then the Allies found one still standing at Raymargen. When the Americans thrust forward and, and saw that it was still intact, it was, it was a godsend. After a rapid strike, the Allies seized the badly damaged bridge, but the Germans fought desperately to stop the first and other units crossing. All I remember is debris everywhere, and there were still Germans laying there, shot and killed. Of course, we double-timed across the whole, the whole bridge. 
under cover from scores of heavy machine guns. And I never saw so many any aircraft guns. They were everywhere, because they were trying to save the bridge from being bombed. The few German aircraft that were coming in, they were just firing away all the time, these 50 calibers. Just after the big red one crossed the bridge at Raymargen, it finally fell down. Unfortunately, when the bridge collapsed, they had a whole bunch of ambulances on board on, on the bridge that had wounded on it, and they all died. With the Rhine now behind them, Nazi resistance slowly began to collapse. We were making maybe 20, 30 kilometers a day. We were just moving, moving, moving. We didn't have any real major big city battles. Most of the time, they surrendered. But when they crossed into Czechoslovakia, over three years of constantly being the first into action took its toll. It even began to shape behavior towards their Nazi opponents. The last few days of the war, they'd come out with their hands up and say, comrade, comrade, you know. And initially, uh, we were taking them prisoners. But they killed and wounded a lot of us guys the last few days of the war. So that's when the colonel said, waste them, unofficially. So. Hey, war, it's awful. It's, it's, it's awful. The first sustained casualties until the 8th of May, 1945, when the Nazis finally surrendered. You know, it was just another day. All it meant to us was we can sleep. So I laid down. And I, I must have slept for 24 hours. I was beat. I was beat and the veterans of so much conflict, leading the way into action in Africa, Sicily, France, and Germany, could finally return home. Both parents and my three sisters were home. They came running to meet me. And my father's first words were, Well, son, maybe we can get a good night's sleep now. Men of the Big Red One say the fact is, is that the US Army comprises them and 10 million replacements. Um, and that was, that was very much the ethos of the division. It was, you know, we are the first, we are number one. Their bravery and extraordinary service in the war was recognized with the awarding of over 4,250 silver stars and 16 medals of honor. President Obama presented the last one, some 69 years later. We've got here some photographs of Alfred B. Nietzsche. He was a machine gunner, serving on the heavy, water-cooled, uh, 30 caliber machine guns. Alfred fought through uh, North Africa. He took part in the invasion of Sicily. And then the regiment was transferred to England in preparation for D-Day. Alfred was billeted down in Dorset, and he met a young woman called Eileen C. White. They were married. Uh, they had a short honeymoon of about a week. And then on June 5th, Eileen heard that the troops were leaving. They were embarking upon the ships. So she went down with a friend to the docks in Weymouth uh, to watch the GIs marching across. And amongst the, the hundreds of GIs that were there, they managed to spot one another. Sadly, that was the, uh, the last time that they saw one another. He fought with the regiment all through um, France. Massive casualty rates, but Alfred managed to survive. He carried on fighting through Belgium and then finally into uh, Germany, where he participated in the Hergen Forest campaign. They took essentially very, very similar casualties to what they sustained on Omaha Beach, so it was very, very atrocious fighting. 
what had actually happened is that Alfred had been man in his position. He stayed with his machine gun until his ammunition was expended, and then he took up his rifle and began firing before, um, sadly, a, a German hand grenade was thrown in and he died of his injuries. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his actions, which was then upgraded to the Medal of Honor in 2014 and presented to Alfred's cousin, Bob Nietzsche, by uh, Barack Obama. Perhaps one of the sadder parts of the story is uh, there was never a picture or a photograph to his name. And uh, thankfully, only um, in 2020 this year, we, we, uh, we were able to track down a picture. We're able to tell it was in England because of the fact he's wearing the overseas cap. They're fantastic photos and it really is nice to be able to put a face to his name. Alfred Nietzsche's outstanding bravery and sacrifice now form part of the legendary record of the Big Red One. They had been thrown into the cauldron of war and they managed to survive, and not only survive, but, but to thrive. As Terry Allen once said, nothing in hell must stop the first division. And that's exactly what happened. Nothing in hell did stop the first division. 1940, in Britain's darkest hour, a new force of crack troops was founded. They didn't think of themselves as very brave people but they were the best. Trained for combat behind enemy lines, they descended from the skies to take part in some of the most daring raids of the war. We came down and I'll be honest, it was hell. From the deadly deserts of North Africa to a heroic stand at Arnhem. We thought the army would be here tomorrow. Tomorrow never came. They established themselves as one of the most elite units in the British Army. They are the Red Devils. An extraordinary war demanded extraordinary soldiers. Well, we were good. We were very good. The best there was. forged into elite bands of brothers. You were fighting for your buddy. You didn't want to let them down. By facing the trials of war together. They attacked us up through the vapor trails and butchered us up pretty good. These are the stories of the Second World War's most famous fighting formations and their journey through tragedy and triumph the German commander said, I've never seen any people as brave as yours. To earn their battle honors. The 27th of February, 1942. In the skies over the English Channel, 12 RAF bombers are about to execute one of the most daring raids of the Second World War. On board, 120 men from the 2nd Parachute Battalion, 1st Airborne Division. Their mission, to capture a German radar. This is the first raid of the newly formed Parachute Regiment. The first sortie into enemy territory. And as the moment to jump approaches, none of these men knows what to expect. In June 1940, the Nazis were in the ascendancy. Norway and France had both fallen to the Germans. And the British had been forced into a humiliating retreat, culminating in the evacuation of 300,000 soldiers at Dunkirk. Part of the Nazis' success resulted from the daring exploits of the Fallschirmjäger paratroopers. Winston Churchill was impressed by the Fallschirmjägers as they performed commando-style raids, landing behind enemy lines by glider or parachute. 
this exciting development of warfare where vertical envelopment in land operations all of a sudden seemed possible and it was the Germans who became the model. German Fallschirmjäger were inculcated with this high self-confidence, high physical skill and the plunging golden eagle was a symbol which was highly regarded. They became an elite and were used so by German propaganda. Churchill was keen to establish Britain's own elite parachute regiment. And on the 22nd of June, 1940, he sent a letter to his chief military assistant, General Hastings Ismay. We ought to have a corps of at least 5,000 parachute troops. I hear something is being done to form such a corps, but only on a very small scale. Advantage must be taken of the summer to train three forces who can play their part as shock troops in home defences. Churchill's call was answered, and the parachute training school was established at RAF Ringway, just outside Manchester. There was a strong desire to hit back at the Nazis, and the new unit's recruits included many men who had recently returned from Dunkirk. Among them was Tony Hibbert. I'd started parachuting as soon as I got back from Dunkirk because I'd been a gunner, I'd been an artilleryman. So I volunteered for a thing called Number Two Parachute Commander, which I'm very pleased to have to. And uh, I joined them in July 1940. Number two commando was soon renamed the 11th SAS Battalion. In early 1941, their first mission attacked Axis forces in Italy. The parachute assault had limited military value, but showed Britain was ready to strike back. In September, this fledgling unit became the first parachute battalion. Soon, three other battalions were raised, and the first parachute brigade was born. What had started out as a small unit was now training thousands to jump behind enemy lines. Physical fitness, intelligence, initiative, character. There was both a physical selection and a mental selection leading to tough soldiers who would keep going in adversity. Everyone must be imbued with the warrior spirit, the determination to succeed, and with leadership which inspires tactical excellence both at the officer level and the senior NCO level. If you think you're second best, you are. There's never a lack of self-confidence in airborne forces. Jim Knox joined the Paras in 1942. The training soon made an impression on the 18-year-old Londoner. In the parachute rovers, you never stopped training. You didn't have leisure time like the yarn has got now. It was train, train, train. And from Rivali to sundown, you weren't allowed to walk, you had to run everywhere. Everything had to be at the double. Yeah, it, it was a real tough unit. The guy who ran it was Sergeant Major Strachan from the number two commandos. And uh, I think his ambition was to kill us. He'd, he'd done a pretty good job. The parachutist must be able to operate his parachute in the air. He must be able to check its direction, prevent it swinging in a gusty wind. For the first week, we were in a hangar practicing drops. For the second week, we did two jumps from a static balloon. Then, five jumps from a Whitley bomber. Of course, the biggest part of the training was actually jumping, and that really was a challenge. In that moment of truth, do you actually jump into the fresh air? They send you to Ringway, Manchester, to do your seven parachute jumps. Two from a balloon and five from a plane and we used the Whitley, where you jumped from a hole in the floor. The Whitley was one of Britain's biggest bombers at the outbreak of war. But it was slow and vulnerable, so they were handed over to the newly formed Airborne Forces. 
With a range of 2,400 kilometers, they could carry 10 paras who would jump through a hole cut in the floor. For the inexperienced, this often proved as hazardous as the mission itself. The problem they had is to throw yourself off the edge with your feet dangling into space, is that you tend to throw yourself forward. And if you did, more often than not, your face would smash into the hinged door on the other side, and that was known as ringing the bell. Men would land with broken noses, black eyes, broken teeth, split lips, and so on, even before they'd come anywhere near a German. Among the recruits to this new parachute brigade was John Frost, an experienced army officer with a decade of military service. Caroline Frost is John Frost's daughter. He was born in India, because my grandfather was in the army in India, and he was sent back to school at the age of five. So his childhood was mainly spent in England, Dad started off as a Cameronian, which is a lowland Scottish regiment, and then he was seconded to the parachute regiment when it formed. Yes, so he was one of the first people to join up. John Frost was a classic volunteer for the airborne forces. Was not happy sitting back, waiting for the Germans to come to him. He wanted to get to grips with them. So he volunteered and became the commanding officer of 2nd Battalion, the parachute regiment, and, and really became one of those totemic figures, um, you know, within the, the pantheon of, uh, of airborne soldiers. In early 1942, Admiral Lord Mountbatten proposed a raid against a radar station at Bruneval, near La Havre, France. The objective was to capture and hold the station, dismantle the radar set and take it back to England. Frost commanded the recently formed 2nd Parachute Battalion, or 2 Para, selected for the mission. The raid had been scheduled to take place on the 23rd of February, but bad weather delayed the plans. Four days later, the skies cleared, and 120 men from 2 Para set off for France. As they approached the French coast, the British planes came under heavy anti-aircraft fire. But none were hit, and the troops made their exit. We dropped last. It was fairly clear conditions. It was a very good exit and landing. The men surrounded the villa where the radar was situated and opened fire. The main party moved up to attack the radar station, which they achieved virtually without opposition. My group was in the rear, mopping up pockets of German resistance, which entailed some pretty heavy skirmishes. While the fighting continued, the radar equipment was dismantled. But as the paras withdrew to the beach, they took casualties. One of the men in my party was killed and we also had a few wounded. Unfortunately, some men got left behind and were captured. They had succeeded in their objective of taking the radar and clearing out the villa, but the danger wasn't over yet. Because of radio communication problems, we had no contact with the Navy. Although we had dealt with the local troops, there was the possibility of reinforcements arriving. Despite the confusion, Frost managed to get most of his troops on the boats that had come to take them home. When the headcount was made, six paratroopers had been wounded, six captured, and two killed. The Bruneval raid became the Parachute Regiment's first battle honour. Its success increased Britain's morale when the war was going badly. The Bruneval raid was a psychological boost for the Brits. It always seemed that anything the Brits did was um, 
a losing proposition. So this was the first winning proposition executed to perfection and allowed us to at least think of the idea that we could go on to offensive operations in the future. And importantly, it reaffirmed Churchill's belief in the future of airborne forces. The powers were already proving their worth. On the 1st of August, 1942, the 1st Airborne Division and Parachute Battalions were renamed the Parachute Regiment. They had already come under the command of First World War veteran Major General Frederick Boy Browning. He felt the new elite regiment needed a distinctive look. It so happened that Boy Browning's racing silk colours prior to the Second World War were maroon and Cambridge blue. So the Pegasus flash in Cambridge blue and maroon becomes the emblem of airborne forces. Pegasus with Bellerophon on its back, the slayer of enemies. Here's the stable belt designed by Boy Browning. There is the iconic symbol of the parachute regiment on the front and the maroon light, the para berry, is the color that's synonymous with the regiment. The color, everything that Boy Browning originally envisaged, they do take on great significance in the minds of, of everyone who serves in the regiment. It's almost like a suit of armor. They're talismans. They meant a huge amount to him. They were labels, better than labels, because they were earned, they weren't bought. He was inordinately proud of being a member of the Parachute Regiment. It meant the world to him. He was enmeshed with the regiment and thought the world of his men. And that's the only way to be. If you're going to go into battle, you need to know that everyone's got everyone else's back. It's an identifier which tells you something about the person who's earned it. It's an identifier which says, this man is someone I can trust, this man is someone I can go to war with. With their new colours came other equipment. From 1942, the iconic camouflaged denim smock, the Denison, was worn over their battle dress. And the original Flash Gordon rubber training helmet, named after the 1930s sci-fi serial, was replaced with a brimless combat helmet modelled on the German version. By late 1942, Germany, with its Italian and Vichy French allies, still controlled most of North Africa. But a plan was underway to force them out. Operation Torch. On the 8th of November, American and British forces began amphibious landings along the coasts of Morocco and Algeria. Opposing them were the Vichy French, troops from the puppet regime installed after France's surrender. Three battalions from the 1st Parachute Brigade jumped from a new aircraft, the C-47 Dakota. This was the first time the British had launched a mass airborne assault. The 1st Airborne were tasked to attack tactically important sites. In particular, the Vichy French artillery batteries that could potentially hit the landing craft and fleet and to take airfields, attack major installations. On the 12th of November, the 3rd Parachute Battalion was sent to seize a vital airfield between Algiers and Tunis. German paratroopers rushed to defend it, but three para got there first and the Fallschirmjäger withdrew. One para now set out to capture another airfield, plus key road and railway junctions. They dropped among Vichy French, who decided not to fight, but then engaged determined German and Italian troops. A few days later, it was the turn of John Frost and two para. Their mission was to take an abandoned airfield, then move on to a second one and wait for ground forces. A successful landing was followed by a long hike, but then the Germans struck with armor and air power. The Paras fought tenaciously, but their relief force never arrived. Frost refused a demand to surrender. It was something which would become a habit of his. 
as was using his hunting horn to rally his men. He now led them on a fighting retreat, suffering terrible casualties before the survivors made it back to Allied lines. Frost's battalion and the other paras had suffered badly. Hurt by poor intelligence and the failure of ground forces to link up with the lightly armed paratroopers. But they had acquitted themselves superbly in battle. The German soldiers that they were facing realized that they were coming up against extremely well trained very aggressive soldiers that were a struggle for them to contain. And those soldiers were wearing red berets. And so the Germans instinctively nicknamed them the Roten Teufel, uh, the Red Devils. The Red Beret was now worn with great pride by all other British airborne troops, including supporting units and glider infantry. Throughout the North African campaign, the 1st Airborne Brigade took part in more battles than any other British formation. They captured 3,500 prisoners and inflicted 5,000 casualties at a cost of 1,700 to themselves. Writing home, John Frost recalled his pride in a job well done. I discovered a few of Dad's letters to his parents written during the war and there were some telling moments that he wrote in them. There are little personal bits in the letters, and then there are a few bits about the war, but obviously it's been passed by the censor, so he had to be careful about what he said. So this is when he's in Africa, and he's writing to his mother, basically trying to put on a good front for her so as not to worry her. And so he writes, your letters arrived in the middle of a battle, and it cheered me up no end especially as I'd just been wounded by a piece of shrapnel. I feel quite a veteran now, having fought several battles. The Germans are good fighters and very brave. It's nice to know, though, that we are so much better. They call us the Red Devils on account of the red berries we wear, and they don't like meeting us one little bit. Our soldiers are marvellous, always cheerful, even when living underwater for days. I must say, I hope this is my first and last war, though. I feel a much older and wiser man. We really have had a doing. So I think justified pride, because in those days, this is what they lived for. They were fighting for king and country. It just became part of his blood, really, and the men so close, you have to be. They were everything to him. I mean, they, because they held each other's lives in their hands every day all day, so the bond you form is lifelong and intense, no question. Many veterans I talked to about North Africa and those who fought at Arnhem would say that North Africa was far worse than Arnhem, which seems incredible to the modern mind. There was a particular soldier called Sandy Carmichael who would say to me, Arnhem, piece of cake, North Africa, hell on earth. So it was really where uh, the hard fighting spirit and the hard yards, the final hundred yards, of those who were in the parachute battalions came to the fore and, of course, uh, included some of the first battle honours. By mid-May 1943, the Allies had driven the Axis armies out of North Africa. It was a victory that would open the door to the liberation of Italy and the Red Devil's next chance for battle honours, the invasion of Sicily. Speed was essential to confuse the Axis armies and capture key bridges and ports. The parachute regiment's airborne assault was critical to success. They were really looking to take and hold so that then the main troops landing on the beaches and at the ports would be able to advance over those bridges into the interior of Sicily uh, and, and conquer the island as, as quickly as possible. Their objective was to seize the crucial Primasole Bridge and hold it until relieved. In the evening, over 100 aircraft and gliders carried more than 1,800 men towards their target. They came under intense fire. 
and only a quarter of the force were dropped accurately. Heavy flak destroyed two of the aircraft in our formation. The situation became rather hair-raising after that. They quickly discovered the German Fallschirmjäger were landing in the same drop zone as they came under heavy machine gun fire. Scores of men were taken prisoner almost as soon as they hit the ground. Only a few dozen men from one para managed to launch their assault on the bridge. I was only able to collect five of my stick. We came under machine gun fire, so I decided to move off with what men I had and try and neutralize them. A defensive perimeter was set up around the bridge, but for three days, the Red Devils were pressed hard. Their first probing attack was weak, easily repulsed. The second and third more determined. Then followed an aerial attack, which was decidedly unhealthy. A tank livened things up by taking pot shots at the bridge. At one point, the Paras were pushed off the bridge, but when reinforcements arrived from the 8th Army, it was retaken and finally secured. A narrow victory had been won at great cost. Over 300 men were dead, missing or wounded. But the Red Devils had fought well, and vital lessons were learned that would benefit them in the fighting to come. Eisenhower believes that the lesson of Sicily is that we should never do large operations, airborne operations like this again. People take those criticisms but learn different lessons. And the real lesson that comes out of it for the future is that we must have very well-trained uh, pathfinders and very well-trained pilots who can navigate um, to a greater effect than occurred then. In May 1943, the Parachute Regiment was expanded with a new unit, the 6th Airborne Division. The natural thing would have been to establish, after the 1st Airborne Division, the 2nd Airborne Division. Uh, but why do that uh, when in 1943 you can set up the 6th Airborne Division and make the Germans think that you'd already set up the 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th? So in effect, they picked that number to make the Germans feel that Britain had the same number of airborne forces that they had. This was part of a great tradition in the British Armed Forces of trying to appear to German intelligence bigger than we actually are. The 6th Airborne Division spent their first year training. It was a long time to wait for action, but they had already been earmarked to spearhead one of the most pivotal events of the war, D-Day. On the evening of the 5th of June, 1944, 7,000 British paratroopers and glider troops prepared to take to the night skies over Normandy. This was the moment they had been training for. We just sat and talked for a while amongst ourselves. Then came the jeep of the RAF crew roaring up and they got out and said, all right, you chaps, don't worry, piece of cake, we'll get you there. It was a tremendous, exciting, light-hearted atmosphere. They would deploy ahead of the mass amphibious assault near Weistrachum. The division's first objective was to capture intact the bridges over the Kong Canal and the River Orne. It was critical to the success of the beach landings to stop German reinforcements reaching the beachhead and driving the Allies back into the sea. Their second objective was to take out the massive Merville battery to stop it shelling the landing beaches. The paratroopers would link up with an advanced force of glider-borne troops charged with taking these key objectives. In the early hours of the 6th of June, before the first Allied troops hit the beaches of Normandy, the soldiers of the 6th Airborne jumped. But strong winds dispersed them, and upon landing, many battalions could only assemble around half their full strength. Despite the setbacks, the Red Devils achieved their objectives admirably. 
But their job wasn't finished on D-Day. The small village of Breville was still held by the enemy and became the launch point for a series of furious German counterattacks. The Breville Ridge became what in the army we would call the key terrain. Key terrain is terrain of such importance that if the enemy get up there, it will be, be, be able potentially to decisively influence the bridges itself. So they had to capture and keep that piece of ground, the high ground. Fighting was fierce, sometimes hand to hand, and lasted for several days. But the Red Devils clung on. I've spoken to German veterans on the other side of the line who constantly went into attack after attack to try and recapture that high ground and were just unsuccessful. They were held back by the, you know, the ferocity of the defence by men who were determined not to give up the ground that they held and deserved their, their moniker of the Red Devils. Breville was finally captured on the 13th of June. But victory had come at an enormous cost, with 162 paras losing their lives. Now fighting as regular infantry, the 6th Airborne Division engaged in ever more brutal combat. As the Allies battled, to break out of Normandy. They were only withdrawn in late August, having spent 82 days in non-stop action, leaving over 500 men dead, more than 1,600 wounded, and at least 700 missing. In September 1944, it was the turn of 1st Airborne Division, veterans of North Africa and Italy, to join the Allied offensive in Northern Europe. They were to become the lead element in Montgomery's audacious plan to outflank the German defences by crossing the River Rhine in Holland and shorten the war. The key to the plan was the biggest airborne operation in history, codename Market Garden. The Red Devils joined forces with the US 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. The Americans would seize bridges at Eindhoven and Nijmegen to allow a British armoured column to reach Arnhem and then enter Germany. It was a bold plan, fighting deep in Nazi-held territory, and the Red Devils would have to hold their objectives the longest. There would then be what can only be described as a madcap charge by British 30 Corps, which would then set off along a single road all the way over bridge after bridge to take them into Germany. And all of that had to happen um, in 48 hours. hundreds of planes, there's planes towing gliders and planes with their parachutes in there. Coming over in England, people say they were just um, armada, they didn't know where we were going, but they said marvellous sight. On the journey, the Red Devils focused on their unrivalled combat experience. Certainly on the flight over, uh, no, no one was frightened, and we'd been parachuting for four years. The DZ, or drop zone, for the British was to the west of Arnhem, so the troops could mass before seizing the road bridge over the river. The landings went to plan. But as the drop zone was 11 kilometers from the bridge, the Germans had time to engage them. John Frost landed on the first day again commanding to para. Using his hunting horn, John Frost managed to gather his troops in and lead them via an unguarded road to seize the northern end of the bridge. 
John Frost's daughter, Caroline, treasures her father's mementos from Arnhem. This hunting horn was presented to Dad by members of the Royal Exodus uh, Hunt in 1939 because he was master of the hounds. And very similar to the one he actually used at Arnhem that's at the Hartenstein Museum in Osterbeck. He used that to call the troops because the radios were being jammed by the Germans and were also not functioning very well on their own anyway. So it was quite a simple method, but it had a very practical application, really. This letter is written from Mr. L. Hoare, who sends Dad an amazing photograph. According to Mr. Hoare's letter, he says, this must have been one of the first and only photos taken of members of the battalion on landing before the Battle of Arnhem. On the back is inscribed, Sunday afternoon, September the 17th, 1944, taken by a Mr. Sean Bachter on the dropping zone at Ginkel Heath at Osterbeck. Front right is Private Hall, front left is Sergeant Jackman, behind is Private Pope, and the rest of the men are Dutch civilians collecting the parachutists. They'll just be all trying to get to the the right place, having left the DZ, they'll be from all directions trying to focus in on the bridge. It's extraordinary. I think the Brits look apprehensive, but I'm sure they're delighted to have reached the DZ without breaking any bones or getting stuck in a tree, which several of them did. So it's probably relief mixed with apprehension because they didn't know what was going to be around the corner or around many corners, all of which were disastrous. Thank God they didn't know, really. Quite poignant. As the Red Devils made for the bridge, one group ambushed the Nazi field commander, Major General Kusin, leaving him dead in his staff car. While most of the Paras ran into two SS Panzer divisions and couldn't reach the bridge, Frost was lucky. He arrived unscathed, and his men set up defensive positions at the north end. Two hours later, they were joined by Brigade HQ, led by Major Tony Hibbert. I actually got to the bridge with my 350 chaps at 9 o'clock in the evening. We set up a perimeter on the north end of the bridge, about four or 500 yards long, about 40 yards wide and we had been ordered in the brigade orders that our job was to capture Arnhem Bridge and hold it for 48 hours until we were relieved from the south. At that time, the Germans realized what was happening and they had started to send reinforcements towards us. The Red Devils held only one end of the bridge and they didn't have enough men to take the other. We got up onto the bridge and they started firing with their heavy machine guns. The German counter-attack was swift and vicious. Artillery shells bursting. And every time they burn, they send great lumps of rubble flying through the air all around you. It was just devastation and burnt out. Nothing to put the fires out. The Paras were lightly armed with mortars and machine guns as their only fire support. Their favorite weapon for close combat was the Sten gun. A perfect example of the British make do and mend wartime ethos. The Sten was cheap to make and easy to mass produce. Specially adapted for the Paras, it fired over 500 rounds per minute, but was accurate to only 60 meters. By the time the Red Devils dropped at Arnhem, the Mark V Sten gun had a new foresight, bayonet, and wooden stock. Under constant attack, 
two para and brigade HQ held the Arnhem Bridge for three days and four nights. We were supposed to have 13,000 men around the bridge. We, in fact, only had 650. And uh, we held it for 72 hours. It was against the 48 that we'd been ordered. But the massively outnumbered Red Devils on the bridge could not hold out forever. After a series of major setbacks, the planned relief from British tanks was now well over 24 hours behind schedule, with no sign of arriving. They'd virtually been without any sleep. We were without water after the second day. We were without food. That out of the 650 chaps, there were nearly 300 wounded in the cellar of my headquarters. Frost was among the casualties, wounded by shrapnel. Unlike North Africa two years before, there was no chance of a fighting retreat to Allied lines. They're short of ammunition, and it's almost inevitable that without any support, they're going to be chewed up and have to surrender. On the 21st of September, Frost, Hibbert, and their men were finally overwhelmed. They were still laughing and joking. Um, I'd, they didn't think of themselves as very brave people. They, 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 they were the best. The German commander came up and said, Colonel Frost, I salute you. He said, I've never seen people, any people as brave, brave as yours. I salute you. The Allied armor fought desperately hard to rescue the airborne troops. We were determined to, we were desperate, not determined, we were desperate to relieve the airborne at Arnhem. The Germans were equally determined that we would not reach them, that they would surrender before we had a chance to cross the River Rhine and get them out. The Paras at Arnhem Bridge had surrendered, but the rest of the first airborne were trapped and fought against overwhelming odds for nine days until ordered to withdraw. The way it came through, they were going to pull out, and we got to the river. The Germans knew we were getting out, so they shelled this. That was the worst night of my life, and I have nightmares about that. But many but you could hear these boats getting machine guns and you could hear them scream and you know out of ten thousand dropped there, two thousand got away. Operation Market Garden had been a catastrophe. It was a grave failure, a grave disaster, one of the the unnecessary disasters in the war. Had it been successful, they'd have shortened the war by six months. That'd have been successful. But in the midst of disaster, the Red Devils had excelled. Their never-say-die spirit marked them out as heroes among the Allied armed forces. What we thought of those boys, what they'd done, and we felt proud of them. We felt proud because what they had achieved, and we thought we got to reach their standards, reach their standards. And that's what we did. The British liked nothing more than a, than a heroic defeat. Arnhem, in particular, was able to do that. The extreme sacrifice and courage of the individuals involved in an operation that almost succeeded, that could have ended the war early, but just fell at the final hurdle definitely fits our national psyche. In 1978, the road bridge at Arnhem was renamed John Frost Brew, John Frost Bridge, in honor of the heroism of Frost and to Para. On the 16th of December, 1944, the Germans launched a massive surprise attack on Allied positions in the Ardennes. In 
just under a week, 30 divisions helped push through kilometers of Allied-controlled territory in what became known as the Battle of the Bulge. Partly in desperation, the Red Devils were again deployed to fight as infantry. They're initially in a blocking position, defensive position, but by the stage they get there, the offensive is already uh, over. And so they are then used on the offensive mode. After savage engagements, the Nazis retreated with heavy losses. Hitler's final fling in the West had failed. At the end of January 1945, the 6th Airborne Division were withdrawn to prepare for the final push into Nazi Germany. Two months later, they teamed up with the US 17th Airborne Division to take part in Operation Varsity. Their role would be another of Monty's grand plans involving a massive airborne landing. The objective was to seize high ground overlooking the Rhine, allowing the Allied army to cross the river below. The lessons of Arnhem had been learnt. The DZs and LZs were going to be close to the Germans, and the Linkop was going to be affected within 24 hours. On the morning of the 24th of March, the Red Devils were preparing for their last great mission on the Western Front. We got up early in the morning, had a good breakfast, egg and bacon, and then we lined up and we had four hours trip to the Rhine. But before we went, we were given a pill. I never knew what that pill was. They said it was to stop us getting airsick. Then we left and we formed up, I believe, over the channel. Over 500 aircraft and more than 1,300 gliders flew directly into German defensive fire. Casualties were high. On the ground, the airborne troops set about securing their objectives. Taken by surprise, German opposition varied between demoralized and fanatical as Nazi diehards defended their fatherland. We moved off and we got over to Hamelkeln, where our job was to hold the railway. No bridges, just the railway. We came down and I'll be honest, it was hell. And um, a lot of people got killed. I relieved myself because I was scared. There was a sniper hitting us from the church, which was nearby, and so all of a sudden, a plane came over and bombed the church. That was the end of the sniper, but they kept firing at us. And after about a couple of hours, everything went quiet. You know, the birds came out, and you can hear everything. More frightening than D-Day. Within five and a half hours, all the Allied objectives were taken. Despite tenacious resistance from the 1st Volschemjäger Army, they linked up with the ground forces crossing the river. Prisoners at first came in hundreds, then in thousands. By this stage of the war, German uh, resistance is beginning to, to lose its cohesion, beginning to collapse. The German army really have their eye in the rearview mirror. They are looking at what comes after defeat, uh, and you are looking towards what's on the homeland and your family, rather than let's all fight for the fatherland and for the Führer. In early May, the 6th Airborne captured the Baltic port of Wismar and linked up with the advancing Soviet Russian troops. As the war came to an end, the Red Devils had earned their reputation as one of the British military's most effective units. The unit had done an exceptionally good job of establishing themselves, particularly in terms of the raiding level, be it at Bruneval or North Africa or Sicily, or at mass level, D-Day, Varsity across the Rhine. They had been able to persuade senior command 
both at military and, and political level, that there was an ongoing value to the capacity to carry out an operation from the air. Operating on their own and fighting tenaciously beyond what they were expected to do in order to be successful in an operation. The success of what they achieved in the Second World War can be gauged by the fact that you know, we still have the Parachute Regiment now. And for the men who wore the Red Beret during the Second World War, the pride at being a Red Devil didn't end on VE Day. It doesn't go away after the conflict is finished. That bond is there forever. It's life-changing stuff. Your men die in front of you or beside you, however much you try to protect each other's backs. That's what happens in war. The connection was extraordinary. They would do anything for each other. They were like a band of brothers. If there's one thing which is true, it is absolutely Shakespeare's great lines on leadership. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that gives his blood for me shall be my brother. And it is why they call it the Airborne Brotherhood. During the Second World War, a British unit won fame as pioneers of armoured warfare. My father was immensely proud of being a British rat. Most of them have been in action since 1940, up until the very last day of the war. They were one of Churchill's favourite divisions, who tackled Hitler's most feared commanders and his worst war machines, at a great cost. Young men would have been alive that morning, and there they were lying down in the square dead. Fighting all the way from the baking sands of the desert to the hedgerows of Normandy. For the first time in my life, I was really frightened. And on to the ruins of Berlin. They are the 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats. An extraordinary war demanded extraordinary soldiers. But well, we were good. We were very good. The best there was. Forged into elite bands of brothers. You were fighting for your buddy. You didn't want to let them down. By facing the trials of war together. They attacked us up through the vapor trails and butchered us up pretty good. These are the stories of the Second World War's most famous fighting formations and their journey through tragedy and triumph. The German commander said, I've never seen any people as brave as yours. To earn their battle honors. The 23rd of October, 1942, El Alamein, Egypt. Tanks from the 7th Armored Division are advancing towards the entrenched Axis positions in Egypt. Then, almost a thousand Allied guns pour fire upon enemy positions. Victory will turn the tide of the war, and the tanks of the Desert Rats are on the front line. Two and a half years earlier, Hitler's Wehrmacht stormed through France, forcing the British Expeditionary Force to make a humiliating withdrawal at Dunkirk. With neither Soviet Russia nor the United States yet at war, Britain stands alone against the Nazis, except for her vast empire. But access to India and the Eastern Empire depends on Egypt's Suez Canal, this is now threatened by Mussolini's fascist forces in neighboring Libya, which makes this the turning point in Britain's struggle with Hitler and his allies. To cover the huge area, Britain had formed a new unit 
called the Mobile Force in 1938. They were there to protect Britain's vital strategic interests. There were two main elements that made up the mobile division. There were the cavalry units who had been mechanized in the 1930s, and then there were the Royal Tank Corps units who were the successors of the First World War tank units. At the heart of the mobile force was the Cairo Brigade, three regiments of light cavalry with an illustrious history. In 1854, the 8th and 11th Hussars were part of the ill-fated Charge of the Light Brigade in the Crimean War. And they were still charging enemy positions on horseback in the First World War. Since then, they had traded sabres and horses for armoured vehicles. The British Mobile Force was formed in Egypt from whatever could be scraped together um, in reality which was a, a kind of a light armour group, a heavy cavalry, a more dragoon-type orientated, bigger tank, bigger gun operation, and an artillery component. It was good enough for dealing with desert raiders, but not for fighting a modern mechanised war, and soon earned the nickname the Immobile Force. Fortunately, Major General Percy Hobart quickly arrived to take command. A champion of tank warfare, Hobart started an intensive training program. From 1939, with war declared, Hobart continued to improve the mobile force. He wanted his men to be capable of winning battles in the harsh desert conditions. Living and fighting in the desert is a truly horrific experience. The heat, terrain, weather, it's designed to make it difficult for human beings to function in any way, let alone in, in combat. Nothing in the landscape to rest or distract the eye. Nothing to hear but roaring truck engines. Nothing to smell but carbon exhaust fumes and the reek of petrol. Then, of course, there are the flies. Lord almighty that such pests should ever have been created. The North African climate wasn't the only source of misery. There were their uniforms, too. The desert during the day can be hot, 45 degrees, and it can drop down to below zero at night. So you need two different types of clothing. You need very lightweight clothing for the day and great coats and, and thick clothing for the night. Rodney William Scott is chairman of the Desert Rats Association and curates a museum in Norfolk, England, dedicated to them. We have a battle dress as would have been worn in the desert and the tunic is made of a rough wool which is incredibly coarse and it irritates like hell. It's awful, incredibly abrasive and it will take the skin off your neck and off your wrist. The soldiers did iron the insides of them, almost scald them to try and cut that down a little bit. It's quite a heavy garment. I'm sure there's many a, a, a swear word have been said over how to stick this on, especially when it's particularly hot. It would, of course, to a certain extent, help with the sandstorms that came up because it was quite hardy. But um, of a night time, when the temperature dropped, I mean, way below freezing, during the day, I'm sure they thought, this is too hot, but during the night, they'd have liked another half a dozen on top of them as well. As the mobile force deployed along the border of Italian-held Libya, the unit received its first setback when General Hobart was fired. The problem that Hobart had was he was a visionary, he was a fantastic trainer of men, but he wasn't much of a diplomat, and he wasn't very good at convincing his bosses that what he was doing was right. And in fact, the story goes that when he arrived in Egypt, his boss said to him, I don't know why you're here, I think you should go home. Fighting people like that became very, very difficult. But the mobile division was fortunate in the replacement. Major General Michael O'Moore Cray, a tough, diligent general. In February 1940, the unit changed its name to the 7th Armoured Division and gained a new nickname, too. One story suggests that the Desert Rat's name came from Hobart after he met a soldier with a pet jaboa, known as a Desert Rat. 
But at the Divisional Museum, Rodney William Scott has an alternative explanation. The badge that I have here is one of the first badges that were ever made. The whole idea of having the Jeboa was thought up by General Michael O. Moore Cray. He had seen Jeboas, the little desert rat, and he thought that that would be quite a good emblem. General O'Moore Cray supposedly took his swagger stick, marked out a rough shape in the sand, and overnight his wife and some other nurses made eight badges. And he handed one badge to CSM Len Burrett, and he said, stick that on Burrett, we're going to be called the Jeboa Troop. Len Burrett turned around and said, well, General, we call them desert rats. And he went, desert rats, that'll do. And that was it. Later on, a lot of the badges were made in a factory. And again, they're different. And to this day, any man wearing a desert rat badge on his shoulder is very, very proud to do so, and quite rightly so. They had also received more up-to-date kit, including deadly 25-pounder artillery. But until now, the Desert Rats hadn't seen any combat. And the Italians had not joined the fight. That was about to change. In June 1940, Mussolini entered the war on Hitler's side. And on the 13th of September, he ordered a full-scale invasion of British-held Egypt. There was more than just a strategic interest at stake. Mussolini wanted to emulate the Roman Empire in all its glory from classical times. He wanted to have a land empire that would, would match his ambition and the prestige he wanted for his nation. And that meant defeating the British in North Africa. The Italians quickly advanced almost 100 kilometers into British-controlled territory before digging in. It was a fatal mistake, giving the British the initiative. Although massively outnumbered, Hobart and Cray had trained the Desert Rats well, and the remodeled 7th Armoured had a decisive advantage in its mechanization. The 7th Armoured became structured around brigades with larger artillery components, with larger engineer and signals components. It grew from the mobile force into an independent divisional unit. The Italian army consisted largely of infantry. What's more, they lacked effective anti-tank weapons. The British commander saw an opportunity. On the 9th of December 1940, he launched a counter-offensive. Raids on a line of fortified camps that lacked the protection of minefields. Perfect targets for an armored assault. Spearheaded by the desert rats fighting alongside the 4th Indian Division. Now, without the traditional preliminary artillery barrage, the tanks would have to break through the defences themselves. But it would preserve the element of surprise. As we came over a small ridge, we saw about 20 Italian tanks cutting across our front to the north. Over the air, I gave orders to my squadron. Enemy tanks ahead form battle line on me and stand by to engage. My eight tanks raced forward to their battle positions. At the heart of the attack was the British infantry tank Mark II, nicknamed the Matilda because the troops thought they waddled like a popular cartoon duck. Holding a crew of four, the Matilda was designed to support ground troops. Its heavy armor provided great protection, but its firepower was severely limited to an obsolete two-pound gun. 
and it could only waddle along at a sedate 14 kilometers per hour. In 1941, it gained the sobriquet Queen of the Battlefield because when it was fighting against the Italians, it had a reputation that it really couldn't be knocked out because its armor was so thick. As a testament to its durability, one Matilda was hit 38 times and remained fully operational. They may have been slow, but the Matildas quickly cut through the Italian defenses. What began as a limited operation became a rout. The success that the 7th Armoured had was huge. The Italian positions were, were very weak and set out extremely poorly. What that allowed the British to do was to turn the raid into an all-out offensive. The Italian 10th Army, their entire front collapsed, and then the British Army forced them to surrender. By December, the Italians had been pushed back 800 kilometers into Libya. But the desert rats continued to advance. And over the next two months, captured 130,000 Italian soldiers. For Mussolini, it was an absolute disaster. A much smaller British force had, in effect, almost destroyed his forces in North Africa. And that, that brought particular joy uh, to the 7th Armoured. On the 7th of February, 1941, after a long retreat, the Italian force surrendered. It was a stunning British victory. But rather than push the Italians entirely out of North Africa, British strategy changed. Churchill called a halt to ongoing British operations and said, Wavell, I need you to send some of your best troops over the Mediterranean Sea to Greece to help out against the German invasion there. It would be a critical mistake. Having seen the total Italian collapse, Hitler came to their aid, bringing one of his best commanders head to head with the Desert Rats. His name, Erwin Rommel the Desert Fox. In February 1941, Rommel arrived in Libya with a newly formed unit of elite German troops, the Africa Corps. Erwin Rommel served with distinction in the First World War. He'd written a book on infantry tactics and had then gone on to command a panzer division during the invasion of France. He'd completely changed the balance of power in North Africa. If there's one word that sums up Rommel, it is independence. He loved independence of command, and he often didn't care about logistic supply lines. He didn't care about leaving open flanks. He would charge in and do his very damnest to create the most amount of mayhem and violence imposed upon the enemy. Rommel's force included three divisions. Their armored backbone was the 21st Panzer Division, equipped with tanks far superior to the Italians. Plus, one of the most feared weapons of the war, the 88 mm multi-purpose gun. Deadly. Even against the heavily armored British Matilda. In April 1941, Rommel launched an attack eastwards to retake land lost by the Italians. The British high command was taken completely by surprise. Within two weeks, the Germans had advanced hundreds of kilometers. Über 28,000 Gefangene strömen in die Sammellager. Unübersehbare Mengen von Waffen, Kriegsmaterial und Vorräten sind erbeutet oder vernichtet. Einer der stärksten Pfeiler der englischen Macht in Nordafrika, das stolzeste Symbol des englischen Widerstandes, ist gefallen. Soon, the Afrika Corps had surrounded Tobruk, a strategically crucial town on the Libyan coast. Tobruk, it's a deep water port, one of the very, very few on the African coast. Every pound of food that you ate, every gallon of fuel, every bullet that you fired had to be brought into a port. Uh, and, and Tobruk was one of the biggest around. So for the Germans, it was vital to seize it. 
and for the British, it was vital to hold it. To brook becomes a key word, a very emotive and important word in the whole of the campaign. Churchill himself, you know, he is always interested in what is happening in Tobruk. When Rommel struck, most of the 7th Armoured Division were refitting their tanks. They rushed west. And for the next eight months, they would be bloodied and bruised in a series of operations designed to dislodge Rommel's troops. None were successful, and losses mounted. There was a clang of steel on the turret front and a blast of flame and smoke. The shockwave left me breathless and dazed. I looked down into the turret, it was, it was a shambles. The shot had penetrated the front of the turret, just in front of King, the loader. The explosion tore his head and shoulders from the rest of his body and, and started a fire among the machine gun boxes stood on the floor. Smoke and the acrid fumes of cordite filled the turret. In September 1941, the Desert Rats became part of the 8th Army. They were expanded with the 22nd Armoured Brigade and Yeomanry units. These were English volunteer regiments that had a record of service going back to the Napoleonic Wars. By the end of the year, the British were ready to take on Rommel, led by the 7th Armoured Division. The German forces were pushed onto the defensive. But the Desert Rats suffered huge losses at the hands of Rommel's panzers and deadly 88mm guns. The German 88mm gun was originally intended as an anti-aircraft weapon. Early on in the war, when British tanks proved almost impervious, to every other weapon that the Germans had, they pressed them into the role of anti-tank guns and found that they were hugely effective. They could hit and destroy most Allied tanks up to about 2,000 yards. Throughout the war, all Allied tankers learned to respect this deadly tank killer. What we all feared the most was the 88 millimeter, a very formidable anti-tank gun. first-class weaponry. I, I really think that the German army must have been absolutely pleased as punch. That was the weapon that all tank people fear the most. It would go straight through a tank. When that 88 millimeter shot came so close to my ear, for the first time in my life, I was really frightened. Every time I saw an 88 millimeter or heard one, I was thinking, oh, I shall have to be washed out of the tank. And it was a horrible thought to be washed out of a tank. Crucially, for a unit that relied so heavily on its equipment, 7th Armoured alone had lost over 500 tanks. The British were losing far more tanks than the Germans. When they actually got to battle with the Africa Corps, the Africa Corps then were fighting them in detail. And, and Rommel famously said, it doesn't matter if the British have got two tanks to my one, if they penny packet them and allow me to defeat them in detail, which is what the, which is what the Germans did. The battle-weary British and Commonwealth forces couldn't keep the Africa Corps at bay, losing all the recent gains. For the men of the 7th Armoured, it was debilitating. We did suffer appalling difficulty in those days. We lost a mass of tanks. We then had to retreat. My first few months in the desert were all filled with retreats. While the retreat didn't collapse into a rout, the division was under constant pressure from the Axis advance. running the gauntlet of German air attacks, their planes bombing and strafing almost at will. There was no escape and little defence against these attacks. Some infantrymen resorted to firing their rifles at the low-flying enemy fighters. Each attack left burning vehicles and casualties. 
On the 21st of June, 1942, Tobruk fell, a serious blow to Allied morale. British forces retreated over 160 kilometers inside Egypt to Mirsa Matru. Churchill was furious. Defeat is one thing, disgrace is another. It was such a big moment, both symbolically and militarily, that Rommel was actually then became a field marshal and was promoted by Hitler, well ahead of his time in the view of most of the other German generals. After the early victories over the Italians, the Desert Rats had barely tasted another success. But as depressing as things were for the British, for Rommel, disaster loomed. They were at the end of their supply lines and his forces were, were pretty much exhausted. The moment Rommel lost the initiative and was forced onto the defensive, his Africa Corps were in trouble. In July, the 8th Army stopped the Axis advance in its tracks at a place called El Alamein. A flood of new American tanks boosted the Allied forces, including the Grant, Stuart, and Sherman. They also gained a new commander, Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery. Montgomery brought meticulous attention to detail, which had been lacking somewhat, and a total belief in victory. The British, by that stage, absolutely outnumbered their opponents. They had more men, they outnumbered them in guns, they outnumbered them in the air. In tanks, it was about five to one. Montgomery arrived at just the right time when a new command was needed to instill that confidence. And, and he did that. He said, El Alamein is where we fight or where we die. You don't get many British commanders saying things like that. It's a, it's a little bit too sort of um, emotionally charged for, for the British sanctuary way of looking at, looking at life. But he wasn't afraid to do that. In October 1942, the Desert Rats would be handed their chance for redemption. For over three months, the rival troops had faced off across the front line at El Alamein. But Montgomery was preparing to deliver a knockout punch, having first stressed its critical importance to his men. When I assumed command of the 8th Army, I said that the mandate was to destroy Rommel and his army, and that it would be done as soon as we were ready. We are ready now. The battle will be one of the decisive battles of history. It will be the turning point of the war. The eyes of the whole world will be on us. On the 23rd of October, 7th Armoured began to advance. under cover of the largest artillery barrage of the war so far, as the massed 25-pounders made their mark. Montgomery wanted to bring German armor into a fight where it would be outnumbered and it would be on ground of his choosing and where he could then utterly destroy it, specifically with the, the 7th Armour Division. And that, in effect, would take Rommel out of the war in North Africa. And that was the whole plan for El Alamein. As we approached the minefields, the sappers in front were clearing a path. We followed, everybody moving with that same quiet determination, knowing what was about to happen. At 3.30, all hell broke loose. Hundreds of guns broke the silence. The noise of the battle was terrific. Over several blistering days, carefully targeted artillery and airstrikes preceded relentless attacks. Until the multinational 8th Army finally broke the Axis line. By the 4th of November, the Africa Corps were in retreat, and Montgomery ordered the Desert Rats to pursue. As we moved forward, we saw hundreds of German tanks that were left, burnt and burning. Bodies splattered against the tank walls, 
and millions of flies. A terrible destruction and a waste of life. As we went deeper into the desert, we saw German and Italian prisoners. There were thousands of them. As the Axis positions collapsed, their troops were captured in their thousands. On the 23rd of January, 1943, the Desert Rats entered Tripoli. They had played a crucial part in the crushing defeat of a renowned Nazi force. It was a turning point in the war. Churchill, his response to Al Alamein was unmitigated joy after two years of endless defeat. At last, he had a significant battlefield victory to trumpet. Before Alamein, we never had a victory. After Alamein, we never had a defeat. By May 1943, the Axis were defeated in North Africa, and the Desert Rats had been key to the victory. They had become veterans of the desert. But now they would be tested again on the brutal battlefields of Europe. After pushing the Axis out of North Africa, the Allies turned their attention to Italy, the soft underbelly of Europe. The 7th Armoured spent weeks pushing north along the Italian coast, but then they were withdrawn to England to refit for a new mission, the creation of a new Western Front, the Normandy landings. For the Allies, it was incredibly important to open uh, a second front um, in Europe. Stalin had been calling on them to do it since 1941. By the summer of 44, the Allies were ready. They were prepared with the largest sea force the world has ever known, a massive, massive superiority in air power and overwhelming land force. Having been in combat since 1940, the Desert Rats were some of Britain's most experienced troops. However, fighting in France would be very different to the deserts and dunes. And retraining back home was a disorienting experience. The Desert Rats were sent to the area around Thetford, where they inhabited really old Nissan hutted camps which were cold, drafty, the rations and standard of catering was particularly poor, and morale took a huge dip. The Desert Rats would need new tanks. For much of the North Africa campaign, they struggled for parity against the Panzers. But as they retrained in the English countryside, they were finally equipped with a machine designed specifically to level the playing field, the Sherman Firefly. The Firefly is a great example of one of the great British design successes of the Second World War. The Firefly was an adaptation of the Sherman M4. Its old 75mm gun was replaced with the superb British anti-tank gun, the 17-pounder. This upgrade in firepower meant that the Firefly could take on the latest German battle tanks, Panthers and the dreaded Tiger. The Firefly 17-pounder gun gave us a much better range against German armor. We also had an advantage that the Sherman was a faster tank than the Tiger and Panther. One in four tanks in any unit would be Fireflies. But the Desert Rat's main armament would now be the new Cromwell tank. You stood in front of a Cromwell Mark IV tank, circa 1944-45, mainstay of the 7th Armoured Division in the Normandy campaign all the way to Berlin. The arrival of the Cromwell marks a sea change in British tank design. Mechanically, she's much more reliable. She's got the Meteor engine, which is basically a non-supercharged version of the Merlin engine. There's some Spitfires, Hurricanes, etc. At full power, this thing could do well in excess of 45 miles an hour. 
The other advantage of being very highly manoeuvrable at high speed is the fact it was much more difficult for the German gunners to get a bead on her. And several of the tank crews say the speed of the Cromwell saved their necks time and time again. The only problem with the tank was the fact she was equipped with a standard 75mm gun, which was not capable of taking out Panthers and Tigers. It was only the 17 pounder anti-tank guns and then the Fireflies that could actually deal with one of those tanks. The tank is marked up Little Audrey. That was the markings of the troop commander, a five troop, B Squadron, 1st Battalion, Royal Tank Regiment, when she landed in Normandy. And our founder, the late Les Dinning, ended up serving in the original of this tank in Normandy. And so he decided that when we set up a memorial, that only should we have a Cromwell, because they're unique to the Desert Rats, it should be marked up in his tank, which I think is a fitting tribute. The D-Day landings in Normandy would pitch the Desert Rats up against an old foe, Erwin Rommel. Rommel was in overall command on the German side of the Normandy beaches. It was he who led the defence. It was he who prepared the Germans for the invasions. He even had the 21st Panzer Division there, which of course had come to be one of his armoured formations when he faced the Desert Rats in North Africa. Towards the end of D-Day, on the 6th of June, the first units of the Desert Rats started to land and push into the Normandy countryside. Despite months of training in England, the challenging terrain was an immediate shock. This was Bocage country. No one knew about the deep lanes, the high hedges. I hadn't got a clue. We plunged through the hedge and then hurtled down about 15 feet into the road, and such an impact that the driver and co-driver were killed. They were small fields with very high hedgerows on five-foot banks. Bokkaj country was brilliant for the defenders. Field after field, bordered with thick Bokkaj, gave the German defenders well-prepared cover overlooking wide open killing grounds. It was hedges all the way around. So each meant it was a little battlefield. The Germans fought in that one, and then they got pushed out of that, they fought in the next one. For those tank crews who have been used to fighting in North Africa, it must have come as a great surprise. The last thing you want as a tank commander is to have that feeling of, of being closed in. Best thing we could do was to try and blast a hole in the hedgerow and the best way to do that was to get an army bulldozer. That took time. It took time trying to get hold of a bulldozer because they were in great demand. On the 12th of June, the Desert Rats were ordered to take the village of villers bocage in an effort to outflank the elite Panzer Lehr Division. villers bocage sits on high ground, on a high ridge, on a, on a main road, uh, and this gave it uh, a, a tactical and strategic positioning um, that its size didn't warrant. So for the Germans and for the British, they would meet at villers bocage in, in what became in many ways a totemic fight that epitomised the Normandy campaign. Units from the 7th Armoured found the village unoccupied. By the morning of the 13th of June, they were spread throughout the village and on the approaching roads in and out. Everything seemed calm. And we came in, beautiful day. People came out of the streets uh, with flowers and cider and calvados. And we thought, this is great. No sign of any Germans. What the Desert Rats did not know was that lurking in the cover was an SS tank ace, commanding a troop of Tiger tanks. Michael Wittmann was Waffen SS Panzer Commander. He'd come to excel in the fighting in Eastern Russia, where he'd become one of the Panzer Aces. When we got to Villers Bokash, from nowhere it would seem a troop of Tigers came from the east, and one of them proceeded to conduct absolute mayhem. I saw this tank come, it moved the 88 millimeters, just like that, then wham, and the shot came. And uh, I was standing up within the turret, looking through the periscope. I ducked down, and 
I felt a tingling between my legs. I thought, well, lucky my legs were apart, I could have knew that the shot must have gone between. All I could see was the mass of flame from the engine. So I said, bail out, and the crew bailed out, and I bailed out, and I was still a bit sort of wondering what's happened. It came down and shot up every vehicle. We were utterly helpless. And A Squadron was completely annihilated. All I can remember of this was the terrible bark of the 88 guns firing. The British were hopelessly outgunned. In just 15 minutes, around 14 tanks and up to 15 other vehicles were destroyed. Bittman caused havoc before he was trapped and his Tigers destroyed, losing irreplaceable tanks. However, the equally unexpected arrival of the 2nd Panzer Division left the British dangerously exposed, forcing a humiliating withdrawal. They had taken heavy casualties, losing over 55 tanks and armored vehicles. In the Villa Bacage, young men who had been alive that morning, and they were, there they were lying down in the square dead. And you think, well, you know, that's going to happen to anyone, you know, on the, in this campaign, but you just have to live with it. Montgomery used the Desert Rats as his trusted veterans from North Africa. But in the Normandy campaign, they would come under criticism for being too cautious or having lost their edge. In some ways in Normandy, the 7th Armoured Division become victims of their own success. They, they were brought back, as we know, to be a, a veteran formation and everybody expected great things of them. They, they were going to be the wonder weapon amongst the British Armoured Divisions. And so as a result of the villiers Bocage problem and some other general feelings of what Montgomery would refer to as stickiness, that, that lack of aggression, he then decided to sack some of the senior commanders. After their bloody June, the Desert Rats spent several weeks recuperating. But in mid-July, they were back in action, taking part in a series of operations designed to capture the city of Caen. Caen was kind of a bogey for Montgomery, and he launched offensive after offensive, total eyes, blue coat, good wood, all, all designed to, to both take the city uh, and then move inland. It took far longer than planned, but by mid-August, the Allies had pushed past Caen and moved slowly towards Belgium and Paris. German positions began to collapse across France. And as the Allies looked to keep the Nazis on the back foot, their attention turned to the Low Countries. The race was on to end the war, and the Low Countries, Belgium and Holland, had some of the largest ports in Europe. So seize the Low Countries, seize their ports, uh, and then get yourself into Germany as fast as you could. By September, the next target is the historic city of Ghent in Belgium. Commanders wanted an armored thrust, fast, deadly, unstoppable. And the Desert Rats fitted the bill. Before dawn on the 4th of September, their tanks rolled across the border between France and Belgium. Along the way, the Desert Rats were greeted by happily liberated civilians. We moved out at first light, as Sherman did about one mile to the gallon, and we refueled out of jerry cans and lived on dry rations. We carried infantry on our tanks and had Canadians as well. On the Swan up to Ghent, we were going up to 100 miles a day or thereabouts, a bloody long way, and it was hard to keep awake. Entering Ghent, it took days to clear the Nazi resistance before the Desert Rats finally got a chance to rest and refuel. Later, there was a colossal banquet in a large town hall with tables, linen, silver cutlery, still wet Desert Rat signs, bully beef, tinned fruit puddings, fresh fruit. Belgian beer and wine. 
The cigars were marked with für Deutsche Wehrmacht. Slept for 14 hours. The desert rats spent the winter re-equipping in the Netherlands, but their reprieve was short. They were ordered to take Hamburg. At long last, they would be fighting on German soil. Hamburg was both strategically and symbolically important for the Germans, even at this stage of the war. Um, it was then, and still is, one of the major cities. The Germans definitely wanted to try and hold Hamburg. What the desert rats had found was that they would come up against pockets of resistance, elite units within the German army who just weren't prepared to give up. Defending this area were students and instructors from the nearby Hitler Youth Cadet School in Hanover. Fanatical, highly trained, and touting the best equipment, these seven companies were serious opposition for the Desert Rats and supporting units such as the 11th Armoured Division. Clustered in those woods were about a thousand dedicated German officer cadets who were determined to die for their fatherland. It was a death trap to go through. Although they were cadets, these were combat veterans. These are, in some cases, the people who had been fighting for two, three, four years. They knew what they were about. After days of bitter fighting, orders came for the desert rats to withdraw. While two fresh infantry divisions engaged the SS cadets, the 7th Armoured now formed the spearhead into Germany. On the 16th of April, the unit liberated POW camp Stalag 11B, which contained desert rats who had been captured in Africa. Thousands of POWs were set free. By the 20th of April, the 7th Armoured were close to the suburbs of Hamburg. But along the way, they were still encountering fanatical resistance. The Germans were now flooding the battlefield with portable anti-tank weapons. The Panzerfaust was a little anti-tank projectile and greatly feared in Germany because everybody could use it, schoolboys could use it, and they could destroy a brand new tank in 15 seconds. So the armor feared it. The simple design made the Panzerfaust deadly, even in untrained hands destroying numerous Allied vehicles. They made the streets of cities like Hamburg deadly for the desert rats. On the 2nd of May, 1945, there came some momentous news. Hitler had killed himself. Just one day later, Hamburg surrendered to the Allies. The desert rats entered a totally devastated city. Hamburg was absolutely ghastly. I shall never forget it. There were several nights of firestorms, hundred and something thousand people killed. All the main buildings were wrecked, were gutted. Old people pushing barrows around, rubble everywhere. It really was quite appalling. I mean, it looked so dreadful. But despite the state of the city, the people they found were not hostile. Hamburg, people came out on the streets, they really wanted to be friendly with the British. And the first thing they would ask us uh, would be for cigarettes. That was a great thing, actually, that um, the German people were very friendly. Soon after the desert rats helped to take Hamburg, the European war was finally over. It was indeed a wonderful and an astonishing sight to see the end of the German army. We'd known for long how disorganised they were and that all administration had broken down completely. Even so, the sight that we now saw was more than we had ever expected. We felt exhilarated actually that the thing that it was once and for all over now that the war had finished. And there was a wonderful feeling to feel now that um, after all those years, they, all the efforts we'd made during the war, civilians and, and military people, had now come to an end successfully. The Desert Rats had been in action from the earliest days of the war, right through to the very end. 
As one of Churchill's favoured units, they were accorded a major role during the Berlin Victory Parade. The parade started with an inspection of Churchill. He's in the half-track inspecting men in front of their tanks. Also, what we have here is a flag, Union flag, flown from the top of one of the tanks from the 7th Armoured Division during the Victory Parade in Berlin. And the Desert Rats, who has fought for so long under this flag, were given the honour of carrying it into Berlin to celebrate the victory over Nazi Germany. For the men of the 7th Armoured, it was a sign they'd done their bit. Flying their flags meant that they could celebrate and commemorate the victory they had fought so long for. The vision must have come a good 3,000 plus miles. Churchill calls it the long road to victory. If you think about how far it is in the deserts of North Africa, all the way to northern Germany and on to Berlin. Most of them have been in action since 1940, and they've fought up until the very last day of the war. I think it was an immense honour for them. Following the war, the Desert Rats remained in Germany as part of the Occupation Army. Here, they helped in the process of denazification and the rebuilding of the devastated country. My father was immensely proud of being a Desert Rat. This is my father's battery. This happens to be the 1936 Berlin Olympic Stadium. So it's like the local tourist spot to get your photo taken. These are the people he spent the best part of four years with. They were his family. Some of these guys in that photo have been in action since 1940. They've seen an awful lot of stuff. Here we have a post-war magazine for September 1945. Tell them what's going on. It mentions in here, the editor says it's B-A-O-R. Up until the end of the war, there were the B-L-A, British Liberation Army. After the war, they became the famous British Army on the Rhine, and that was an official change of title in this time. Divisional signposts listed everywhere they have been, all their battle honours from the division. And this was a nice memento of their journey from the deserts all the way to northern Germany, to the heart of the Nazi Empire. At the end of the North African campaign, Churchill said it would be any man would be proud he could say he marched with a desert army. This was their badge of honour, the Desert Rats. My father was proud until the day he died. On his coffin, he had Jaboa to see him off to the next world. The Desert Rats remained part of the British Army for decades, earning further battle honours across the world until they were finally converted from an armoured unit to an infantry one. But although the vehicles may have gone, the famous badge and the nickname remain. For the Desert Rats, their legacy is assured. Other armour divisions served with great distinction and courage, but the seventh was something different. Beating Rommel at his own game in North Africa is a really big feather in your cap. And then to continue onwards to your final glory being a successful capture of one of the largest cities in Nazi Germany and surviving as a unit intact until then is a pretty great achievement. The modern British Army have got so much to thank the Desert Rats for. We have learned how to do tank warfare and how to be good at tank warfare because of units like the 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats. So I take my berry off to them. During World War II, when things looked at their worst, an elite American airborne unit was created for the most extreme combat missions. There were tracers all around. You could see the stuff going through your parachute. They were the first US soldiers to set foot in Nazi-occupied France, who took part in the biggest airborne assault in history. At 800 feet, that 20 millimeter fire is vicious. And stood firm in the face of Hitler's last offensive. We killed a couple of them, and then all hell broke loose. Before tackling the Führer's famed Eagle's Nest. I brought back a bottle of cognac said for the Führer's use only. They were the United States 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles. An 
extraordinary war demanded extraordinary soldiers. But we were good. We were very good. The best there was. Forged into elite bands of brothers. You were fighting for your buddy. You didn't want to let them down. By facing the trials of war together. They attacked us up through the vapor trails and butchered us up pretty good. These are the stories of the Second World War's most famous fighting formations and their journey through tragedy and triumph. The German commander said, I've never seen any people as brave as yours. To earn their battle honors. On the night of the 5th of June, 1944, across southern England, 6,600 paratroopers from the US 101st Airborne Division are bound for Normandy. The first wave of the most ambitious invasion plan in history. Over the past two years, the war has turned in the Allies' favor, but the Nazis are still a potent force. Entrenched across Western Europe, and armed with some of the war's most formidable weaponry. Success for the Allies will depend on these men, the Screaming Eagles. The 101st Division of the United States Army was created in the dying days of the First World War. But the war in France ended before they had even begun recruiting. The division was demobilized. But in 1921, the 101st was reconstituted at Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was at this time that the Screaming Eagle emblem first became associated with the division. Dr. John O'Brien is director of the Don F. Pratt Museum, the official museum of the 101st Airborne in Kentucky, USA. I have two shoulder patches that represent the 101st Division. Now there's some unique features to this patch. The division organized in Wisconsin in 1923, and the 101st Infantry Division looked for heritage from Wisconsin. And what they found was there were three regiments in the American Civil War that were organized from Wisconsin on the Union side. One of those regiments was given an eagle, which became the mascot. The Eagle, Old Abe, the War Eagle, led the regiment into battle 33 times, and a Confederate general even put a bounty on the head of Old Abe. When the division was reorganized in 1923 as a part of the Wisconsin National Guard, on the heraldry here, the Eagle represents Old Abe. And if you look at the flames, they symbolize the Phoenix rising from the ashes. In my other hand, you have the patch when the 101st became airborne, and the new addition is the airborne tab. When America entered the war in December 1941, the 101st were still just reservists. But on the 15th of August 1942, they were made into a new paratroop unit, the 101st Airborne Division. Addressing his troops, the division's commanding officer, Major General William Lee, declared, The 101st Airborne Division has no history, but it has a rendezvous with destiny. Let me call your attention to the fact that our badge is the Great American Eagle. This is a fitting emblem for a division that will crush its enemies by falling upon them like a thunderbolt from the skies. In summer 1942, the recruitment drive to find volunteers for the Screaming Eagles kicked into gear. Glossy advertisements and an extra $50 a month had men throughout the US Army rushing to join the Screaming Eagles. Among the first to sign up was Ed Shames, who would rise through the ranks to become a lieutenant and then colonel. They put pamphlets out and showed this beautiful uh, parachute uh, uh, gentlemen with these beautiful boots 
with a gal on each arm, and idiots like me fell for it. And uh, we were looking for something uh, ideal, you know, something different. But when the division's recruits were sent to Camp Tekoa, Georgia, they encountered a brutal regime. Here, the basic training was specially designed to weed out all but the toughest. Carl Beck was 19 years old when he joined the 101st. The training and all is just built to run your nose into the ground and make you, make you hurt. Because when the rubber met the road, that's when they wanted you to be in shape. The training was so key because they wanted to make us a super unit. And as a matter of fact, in order to get into this unit, you had to have an IQ of 110 or better, and they had to be in superb physical condition. At the heart of the wannabe paratroopers' grueling fitness regime were regular runs up local landmark Mount Currahi. At the end of the training area in the core was this mountain. The first day, they said, OK, we're going to run that mountain three and a half miles up, three and a half miles down. You're going to run it, you're not going to walk, and you're not going to stop. If you stop, you're out. And 18% was out that first day. We also had an obstacle course. People broke their arms, necks, legs, backs, and so forth on that obstacle course. It was wicked. But of course, that made the 101st Airborne Division. Paratroop training tends to be very, very physical. They have extreme aggression, determination to succeed no matter the odds. They see themselves as separate, you know, as superior. They're willing to do whatever it takes in combat. After three months of basic training, the 101st Airborne were amongst the fittest soldiers in the US Army, a fact which didn't win them any friends with their new instructors at jump school. When our regiment moved to Fort Benning to go to jump school, they had instructors that were supposed to be the Flash Gordons of the world, you know, the superheroes and all that stuff. And we would run those guys around Lawson Field. And we'd say, hey, you know, come on, let's keep going, you know? <laughs> and, and we'd run those instructors crazy. And we ran for about two hours, and we looked around in the jump school teachers they looked like their tongues were hanging out and we weren't even breaking a sweat. On top of the grueling physical challenges, there was also the question of jump training. They decided that everyone was going to jump and they did. The only ones that didn't were the ones that were hurt. You need to jump out of a balloon and then move on to actual jumps from aircraft. And only once you've done that can you claim your paratrooper's wings. And such a finely honed unit needs equally refined kit for this new type of warfare, particularly purpose-built weapons. The M1A1 was a specially adapted version of the M1 carbine, a 30 caliber semi-automatic with a 15 round magazine and an effective range of up to 300 yards. Originally designed in 1938, it had never been intended for use as a primary infantry weapon. But the M1A1 had one feature that made it perfect for the men of the Screaming Eagles, a folding buttstock that meant it was lightweight and easy for paratroopers to carry when dropping out of the sky. In June 1943, the 101st Airborne showed just how far it had come, performing well in manoeuvres. By that stage, they were trained as well as they could be they really started to come together as a unit and to establish a reputation among both their comrades across the US forces and, and indeed with British forces. But well, we were good. We were very good. The best there was. The spirit that we evolved during our airborne training is you're just not gonna let your friends down. In September 1943, the Screaming Eagles joined the massive Allied build-up in England, destined to take part in the next decisive phase of the war. Tehran Conference at the end of November, beginning of December, 
1943 was the first meeting of what would become known as the Big Three. The main focus of the conference was Stalin's demand that the Anglo-Americans open a second front. He wanted that to be in France. The countdown to D-Day had begun. In the Italian campaign of 1943, American paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne had made combat jumps into Sicily. Gale force winds scattered the drops and blew gliders off course. But once landed, the paratroopers were able to sow confusion behind enemy lines. But for D-Day, Allied commanders wanted to use airborne troops on a scale that would dwarf all previous efforts. The D-Day plan involved three airborne divisions landing in Normandy. The British 6th Airborne would protect the eastern flank of the amphibious landings. The American 82nd Airborne would screen off the western flank. And the Screaming Eagles would land behind Utah Beach, securing the roads inland and protecting its southern flank. Planning for D-Day was a monumental logistical and strategic effort. But in order to maintain secrecy, most of the hundreds of thousands of soldiers were kept completely in the dark. One time when we went to make what we thought was a jump, they'd built an enclosure on the end of the runway that looked like a kind of a, like a minimum security prison. So we went into this area, you could get in, but you couldn't get out. And that's where we got briefed for Normandy. I knew it was coming because I was an operations sergeant of the battalion and I attended all these meetings with the operation officer. And uh, I did the sand tables for the invasion. Sand tables, of course, uh, is a replica of what you're supposed to be seeing on the ground. On the evening of the 5th of June, the men of the Screaming Eagles received their orders. Its 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment got theirs from a special guest, General Eisenhower. Little did they know that their Supreme Commander feared he was waving off doomed men. The paratroopers would be jumping into enemy territory at night. Inevitably, many would be lost and scattered in the darkness. While gliders would attempt to land onto fields where the Germans had set out thousands of stakes to rip them apart. Here is the CG-4 Waco glider, developed in World War II to help overcome the problem of the paratrooper being so lightly equipped. The function of the glider was to be able to get more heavily armed and equipped soldiers and equipment into the battlefield that the paratroopers had just secured the night before. It could carry a Pac-75 howitzer, or an anti-aircraft gun, or an anti-tank gun. The tow rope had a piece of communications wire that provided a battery-powered telephone system. The tow pilot could communicate to the glider pilot, release, 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 and the glider pilot could reach up and there's a big red handle that he could pull down that opened that allocator clip and the glider descended to the ground. The aircraft is made of about 7,000 pine wood parts, some aluminum tubing, and is covered in canvas that has been doped. Uh, the soldiers that actually rode in the gliders, um, it was a scary proposition. It was very uh, dangerous from ground fire. Tracer rounds could catch it on fire. Everybody talks about throwing up in their helmet. And of course, the landing, once the glider is cut loose, it begins a descent of seven feet down for every one foot forward. Uh, so uh, the landings could often be described as a controlled crash. As the 101st prepared for battle, some of the men looking to America's frontier past shaved their heads. A few of the outfits got the idea they ought to show the Germans we had Indians in America. Here they are, Indians from the Loop, from Back Bay and the Bronx. 
But I do want to mention that at this point in our lives, we were 17 or 18 years old. And the thing that you feel, of course, is a little bit of fear, pretty much of the unknown. But the greatest fear to me, and I'm sure I express this for my comrades, was to not let my friends down. The museum figure that we're looking at depicts how a paratrooper from the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division would be uniformed and equipped for the jump that occurred on 6 June 1944. Paratroopers wore a distinctive uniform. They were going to be cut off behind enemy lines, so they needed to bring whatever ammunition, medical supplies, food, uh, with them when they jumped out of the airplane. So the uniform itself has additional pockets sewn on the jacket and on the pants that could be stuffed uh, with additional equipment. A creative idea that the soldiers came up was the development of a leg bag. And you see something here that looks like a duffel bag. Extra ammunition and supplies could be put into this bag. And it has a rope about 50 feet long. Uh, the parachute would deploy, he would come down, the bag would hit first, uh, he would drift a little bit away from where the bag landed and landed and be able to follow the rope back to where his additional supplies uh, would be located. Underneath the reserve parachute is the Griswold bag. The M1 rifle could be taken into three parts and put in the bag, reassembled very quickly. The first aid pack strapped to the shoulder a wrist compass, a combat fighting knife. When you put the weight of the parachute, the reserve, the equipment, the weapons, the medical gear, the food, the water, uh, he's carrying between 60 and 80 pounds uh, of additional equipment, or in some cases, you know, nearly half his body weight. So these guys had to be fit, and they worked. In the night, the men of the Screaming Eagles boarded their transports and began to taxi for takeoff. They would fly to France in one of the war's most iconic planes, the Douglas C-47 Skytrain. The C-47 was the most ubiquitous troop transport of the whole war. The British called it the Dakota, but to the US Army, it was known as the Skytrain. It served on every front, even in Eastern Europe, where it was produced under license by the Soviets. An adaptation of a civilian airliner each C-47 would carry a stick, or group of 18 to 28 paratroopers. It was powered by two 1,200 horsepower engines, with a range of 1,600 miles and a maximum speed of 230 miles per hour. Supreme Allied Commander Eisenhower ranked the C-47 alongside the bazooka, jeep, and atomic bomb as the technical innovations that won the Allies the war. This is what got the 101st behind enemy lines. This was the key to vertical envelopment. On the night of D-Day, hundreds of these aircraft were used. They filled the skies. In Normandy, a German commander who looked up and saw the air armada flying over said, if only once I could have such power in my hands. A story that has to be mentioned is the bravery of the men who flew these aircraft. It was absolutely essential that they fly in formations at particular altitudes at a particular speed. Otherwise, it was unsafe for the men to, to jump. Flying these aircraft in Normandy, the pilots encountered a lot of German anti-aircraft fire. So in order to maintain those formations, oftentimes the pilots would put themselves at tremendous personal risk. A complete lack of armament was the Skytrain's greatest weakness. However, by June 1944, the Allies had almost complete control of the skies. But while the Luftwaffe threat had been largely neutralized, anti-aircraft gunners still posed a major danger. As soon as the planes reached France, they entered a hailstorm of flak. You're at 800 feet, and that 
20 millimeter fire is vicious. If you're ever in an airplane that gets hit, and I hope you never are, it sounds like your head's in a bucket and somebody's pounding on the bucket. Have you ever been to one of these places where they have fireworks? Well, that's what we jumped in, that you could hear the stuff and see the stuff going through your parachute because there were traces all around. And uh, how in the world they missed any of us, I'll never know. And you could hear those bullets shooting through the parachute. And that's the sound that I can hear right today. They really put it on us. The incoming fire caused the pilots to panic. The planes were traveling too fast to drop their troops. But in their eagerness to dump their men and get out of the maelstrom, the Screaming Eagles were told to jump, more or less, at random. Our routine training called for us to get green light and go. But all we ever got was a bell. And a bell just means unass this airplane. These guys, they could hardly walk getting out of that door because of the weight that they were carrying. So the jump master threw the bundle out, and out we went. We were completely off the drop zone and uh, just scattered all over. The men of the 101st spent most of the night trying to regroup. So I landed in this bunch of cows, had no idea in the world where I was. What I knew, I was absolutely the operations sergeant. I knew my maps, I knew the directions of where we were supposed to go. And I said, OK, buddy, you got to go at least northeast, which I did. And uh, I picked up a total of 18 men that had jumped near that area as we traveled down the road the three or four miles to the, to the bridges. Carl Beck found himself all alone. When I landed, I had to say my canopy of my parachute had gone over some trees. So I pulled out my jump knife, cut my way out of my canopy, and I went to looking for somebody. And I found one guy. 10,000 guys dropped on that peninsula that night, and I found one, my friend Robert Johnson. The Allies knew that the paratroopers were likely to be scattered in the darkness and in danger of blundering into enemy troops before they could find their comrades. So every man was issued with a special cricket clicker. With all our clickers, which by the way, the clicker is, here I am, I hear you. That's the, sign, the thing of the clicker. And uh, when I, with all these signs and counter signs and clickers and being a great soldier, when I saw Robert, I said, hey, Johnson. And so uh, Robert and I, got together. This is a metal cricket. It was a originally a toy that was part of a board game that British children played in the 1930s and early 1940s. And it was made use of by the 101st Airborne Division on the night of the invasion of France. The metal cricket uh, makes a noise like a cricket. One of the problems that the 101st Airborne Division had to overcome was that they were going to be jumping at night. You cannot see anybody around you, and it's very, very important to link up as quickly as possible. The soldiers, each one uh, equipped with one of these uh, crickets, uh, was able to, if they heard a noise, give the challenge. And if it was Fritz, Fritz didn't know what it was, so the soldier could take him out. Uh, if it was Fred, a friendly soldier, he would give the, the counter recognition two clicks. So a very clear delineation between friend and foe, the cricket. And I heard some firing not too far up the road. It was a small enemy patrol, I would say five men maybe. We'd killed a couple of them. Then I got my men back on the road, and I got about 100 yards. And then all hell broke loose.
Due to the confusion, the 101st weren't able to achieve their formal objectives. But this didn't mean that the drop was a total bust. Despite all of the problems that they had in being scattered on landing, on losing a good chunk of their command hierarchy, they managed to fulfill most of their task that day. The 101st caused considerable confusion and disruption to the Germans. Airborne troops were on hand throughout D-Day to take on new objectives at a moment's notice. The most famous would be an attack by 12 men from Easy Company of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Their target was a German battery shelling Utah Beach. It was led by Lieutenant Dick Winters. Winters turned out to be a great leader in combat. He called all the shots and we followed his orders. He was smart, quick, resourceful, fearless. I had a lot of respect for him. I knew after the first bullets came in that day, we had a good commander leading us. You knew you could follow Winters anywhere. Winters and his men not only disabled four artillery pieces, but also captured a map detailing every German gun position on the Contentan Peninsula. The attack became a textbook example of small unit combat. For the next week, the 101st would be locked in a fierce battle to capture the crucial junction town of Carentan. The town of Carentan was a key transport hub. The Allies needed to capture the town so that they could then start to exploit inland into the countryside as quickly as possible. The Germans realized this and realized they, were going, they had to heavily defend it. The battle for Carentan was characterized by bloody hand-to-hand -hand fighting and high casualties on both sides. Much of the fighting pitted American paratroopers against their German equivalents, the elite Fallschirmjäger. The armor was in Carentan. They had to go across that river to defend the beaches. And our job was to prevent anything crossing those bridges, which we did. At one point, Colonel Robert Cole of the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment led his men to dislodge German defenders, blocking the way to the last of four bridges. It was a desperate and costly fight, but cleared the way for the capture of Karen Tan. This uh, presentation has the picture and citation pertaining to Lieutenant Colonel Robert Cole. He was one of the two men in the 101st Airborne Division who were awarded the Medal of Honor, our highest uh, valor medal in the United States Army. With utter disregard for his own safety and completely ignoring the enemy fire, he shouted to his men to follow him in the assault. Catching up a fallen man's rifle and bayonet, he charged on and led the remnants of his battalion across the bullet-swept open ground and into the enemy position. Colonel Cole was put in for the award, and he never knew that he received it. Several months later, in Holland, he sustained a mortal wound, so he received the award posthumously. After 33 days of continuous combat in Normandy, the 101st were withdrawn to England. But their respite would be brief. They soon joined British Paris and the US 82nd Airborne in an ambitious plan to break into Germany and bring about the final defeat of Hitler's regime. By September 1944, over three months after D-Day, the Allies hadn't taken as much of Western Europe as hoped. But after the collapse of German forces in France, the Allies sped eastwards, until Nazi resistance hardened again, as they inched closer to German soil. The strains of war were also having an impact on the relationship between the Allies, particularly their commanders. D-Day was a success. However, fighting thereafter turned pretty quickly into a, a battle of attrition, and the Allies struggled between themselves uh, as to how to break that deadlock. The Americans, particularly you know, Omar Bradley uh, and George Patton, on their side considered the British under Montgomery's command to be too cautious, not willing to take the risks necessary to bring a swift and decisive victory. 
In order to break into Germany and bring a quick end to the war, Field Marshal Montgomery came up with a daring plan to bypass the formidable German fortifications known as the Siegfried Line. It was given the code name Operation Market Garden. At the very heart of the plan, the Screaming Eagles. The first Allied airborne army would secure a series of bridges, making it possible for a vast British armoured column to make a dash across Holland to the Rhine. British 1st Airborne would take the furthest bridges at Arnhem. The American 82nd Airborne would secure Nijmegen, and the 101st were tasked with taking the southernmost bridges around Eindhoven. At first, it went well. Despite taking some flak, the 101st executed a textbook landing in the Dutch sunshine. It was a far cry from the chaos of D-Day. The drop was beautiful. It was what we call a parade ground drop. And it was so vast, there was planes still taking off in England while men were dropping in Holland. There was a huge, huge drop zone right outside of Eindhoven. I landed and right on the drop zone, and it was filled with big Holstein cows. And they panicked, of course, when all these parachutes started coming down. And I'm thinking, oh man, I'd hate to have to write home from the hospital so that I was severely wounded by a big Holstein cow or even killed by one. The Screaming Eagles moved quickly to secure landing zones for the glider board troops that were to follow. They headed for a bridge on the outskirts of Eindhoven, but the Germans blew it up before they could capture it. Attention turned to another bridge nearby at best, but men from the 101st only got to within 100 meters before it too was blown. This is when the Medal of Honor winner, Colonel Cole, was killed by a sniper. And the same day, the regiment won its second Medal of Honor, when Private Joe Mann, already wounded, threw himself on a grenade to save his comrades. But by nightfall, the US paratroopers were in control of the three local towns. A temporary Bailey Bridge had been constructed over the canal and they entered Eindhoven to a hero's welcome. The Dutch people were so helpful, trying to help in every way they could. I had a, some ammunition, mortar ammunition, and even 60 millimeter mortar ammunition it gets pretty heavy. The men had to carry it quite a ways. One guy had a cart and he came over and he says, I will take it, I will take it to where you go. I said, you know, that's a pretty good friend there. By the evening, armor from British 30 Corps raced through Eindhoven heading north. The first stage of Operation Market Garden was complete. But the job of the paratroopers was far from over. Their task was to defend their stretch of this vital road from German counterattacks. For the next eight days, the US paratroopers fought a series of bitter engagements along the roadway now earning its nickname, Hell's Highway. For the Germans, it was key. If they could then cut it at any point, it would help stymie the Allied operation. So the 101st had to keep it open, um, but units of German stragglers, often thrown together, uh, constantly brought it under fire and cut it repeatedly. Um, and, and it really was a very, very dangerous place to be. The Germans saw the threat and rushed whatever troops and panzers they could into scratch combat formations known as Kampfgruppen to try and cut the road. These Kampfgruppen included the remnants of veteran units, and they were equipped with some of the latest and most deadly Nazi war machines. A British crew in an American tank with a long barrel 76 millimeter on it was going to cross a double railroad track and come out toward the sand dunes. Some of our guys told him, we've got an 88 firing down that railroad track and we can't find that SOB, we just can't find it. 
When that tank came up and the old got over, just about the first railroad track, that 88 put three rounds in him. And it's the shrapnel and the stuff that spalls off the inside of a tank that makes hamburger out of a crude. And what had happened, this crowd had taken the backside of a house and dug it out. And he was firing down this railroad track through the door of the house. And that's why we couldn't find that sucker. While the two American airborne divisions managed to capture their targets, the final set of objectives at Arnhem proved to be a bridge too far. On the 25th of September, British paratroopers, surrounded and taking heavy casualties, were forced to surrender. Monty's dream of a spear thrust into the heart of Germany and Christmas in Berlin lay in tatters. After nearly two months defending a road to nowhere in Holland, the Screaming Eagles were shipped out to France for a well-deserved rest. I managed to get a three-day pass to Paris, and a runner came down, and he says, the colonel wants to see you right away. Well, I took off up the road. I knew something was serious. The Screaming Eagles' chance to take a break from the front line was about to be interrupted. December 1944. Nazi resistance has collapsed back to the borders of Germany, but Allied attempts to break through have stalled in the face of bitter resistance. And on the Eastern Front, the Soviets continued their costly advance towards Germany. Hitler remained convinced that victory was within his grasp as long as Germany could knock the Western Allies out of the conflict. And he believed he had spotted a critical Allied weakness. His plan was an audacious armored assault through the heavily forested Ardennes. A three-pronged attack through the Allied lines would deny them the use of the port at Antwerp and cut off the Allied armies. Hitler most definitely didn't have the full support of his generals for the Ardennes offensive. There were no cheers, no salutes. Um, the, the assembled generals and senior officers simply filed out, holding their, their heads in their hands. On the 16th of December, 1944, German military units began their assault, catching the Allies entirely by surprise. In France, and completely unaware of these developments, the men of the 101st were looking forward to some long overdue rest and recuperation. I was to take 50 soldiers and two trucks to Paris, and instead the military police picked us up, said we had to come back, to get on trucks to go somewhere where we didn't know. Nobody knew where we were gonna go. We had no overcoats. We had no overshoes. We had no gloves. We had almost nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. Get on these trucks and mount the machine guns over the side. Crouch are just up the road. And I said, man, I don't need this stuff. I, you know, I need to recover my <laughs> over this Paris trip. So sure enough, we got on these trucks, rode for two or three days, and dismounted just south of the town of Bastogne. The Screaming Eagles were rushed to the small Belgian town of Bastogne. Here, the US Army would make a stand to try and break the German advance. Bastogne, as a transport hub, was incredibly important. If you needed to move east, west, north, or south, you had to have Bastogne. So it was a race, really between the Americans to reinforce the town uh, and the Germans who could get there first and, and then exploit to the west. Germans had not reached Bastogne at that point. So my co the commander says, I want you to get up this road here until you run into the Germans and stop them. I say, yes, sir. They were attacking with divisions, the Germans were. And I had one rifle company with about 100 men. Only one of the three German thrusts had made any real progress in the offensive, and the 101st were now directly in their way. Their race to get to Bastogne before it was completely cut off was so close that the rear units, containing all the division's medical personnel, were captured. They were now completely surrounded and outnumbered five to one. We were encircled. We were encircled the minute we got there. Surrounded, completely surrounded. 180,000 Germans. Bad weather grounded Allied air power, 
making resupplying the besieged troops from the air impossible. Oh, it was brutal. It was brutal. We ran out of food, and we're just about out of ammunition. We got a break in the weather, and some C-47s came in and threw out some bundles of ammo, and we got the ammunition in, and they had about five medical officers parachuted in. And they started working at the aid station. And I was glad because two days later, I was back there myself. Adding to the misery for the Screaming Eagles was the freezing weather. Weather was uh, very, very, very nice. 17 degrees below zero. The worst part of it started snowing. And it snowed before it stopped about knee deep. And it was windy. So they must have had a, with a wind chill of 30 degrees below zero. Oh, it went from bad to worse. We had no shelter whatsoever except uh, tree boughs and uh, uh, foxholes. It was so cold, actually, we had sorrets, little morphine sorrets. So I reached up for my first aid kit that was on top of my helmet, got that sorret out, and shoved it in my leg to ease the pain. It was so cold. Over the next five days, German troops launched probing attacks against the 101st. It was grim, attritional warfare. Conditions at the time were terrible. The American Paris, and most of them just had uh, their summer uniforms. They lacked everything that you needed to survive in, in what were truly, truly dreadful conditions at the front. What's depicted in this case are artifacts from the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the defense of Bastogne. The large photograph here that shows very famously General McAuliffe, who conducted the defense, holding that very same sign. It was the worst and coldest winter on record in Europe in the 20th century. And there was a lot of ad hocery that had to go together to stay warm. They were actually even stuffing their uniforms with newspapers to provide extra layers of insulation. Brutal, brutal temperatures, soldiers doing what they could to survive. The US Army also at this time did not have winter camouflage. So the citizens of Bastogne and some of the surrounding villages uh, donated their bed linens. Um, there's a very unusual piece here, this uh, musical instrument. It's a gazoo with a slide. There was a famous American comedian uh, who used this as part of his comedy act, which he nicknamed a bazooka. The soldiers looked at the M1 rocket launcher used to great effect at Bastogne by the infantrymen of the division. Uh, they nicknamed the M1 rocket launcher the bazooka because it looks like the same uh, bazooka from the comedy act. In spite of the hardships, morale remained high and the men of the 101st responded to the dangerous situation with gallows humor, even giving themselves a new nickname, the battered bastards of Bastogne. The Germans came in and asked for our surrender, and Tony McAuliffe, the general, thought that they were going to surrender to us. And when he was told, no, no, they want us to surrender, he said, all oh, nuts. What am I going to tell these guys? And General Kennard, who was then a, a uh, bird colonel, said, well, that last remark you made was pretty good. He said, what was that? He said, you said nuts. So he said, OK, and they wrote it down. And he, Harper handed this guy the note. And he said, Noitz, Noitz, what does this mean? And Harper said, it means we're going to kill every goddamn soldier who tries to get in here, every damn journal who tries to get in here. People have asked me, well, did you think about surrendering? And I said, no, there wasn't a single soul that ever said a single word about surrender. That was not in our vocabulary. We were trained not to think that way. We are always going to prevail no matter what. There happened to be some of the public affairs newspaper soldiers in the division, 
and they recorded the surrender ultimatum and the commander's response. You can read the surrender ultimatum, and then the troops were informed that our commander, General McAuliffe, replied one word, nuts. We point this out to our, our new soldiers, and the message is a paratrooper, a screaming eagle, never quits. Late on Christmas Eve, Luftwaffe planes strafed Bastogne. One bomb hit an aid station, killing 30 of the wounded soldiers and their nurse. The next day, the Germans launched their most sustained offensive on the town. Even under fire from panzer tanks, the Screaming Eagles held on. One day later, troops from the US 37th Tank Battalion finally broke through the German lines and relieved Bastogne. The Germans needed to move swiftly. The whole ethos and concept of the operation was one of speed. By holding Bastogne, the American Paris really did damage the, the offensive, almost, uh, almost to the point of death. In the days following the siege, the Screaming Eagles were ordered onto the offensive, tackling German units along the fast collapsing front line. They came face to face with some of the most battle-hardened and fanatical German units, including regiments from the SS Lebstendart Division, Hitler's bodyguard. The Screaming Eagles' exploits at Bastogne made it one of the most famous units in the entire US Army. But the siege had taken a heavy toll. The 101st lost over 550 men, while some units suffered 50% casualties. The Battle of the Bulge was the Screaming Eagles' last sustained action of the war. However, even as the trials of combat were approaching their end, they were about to witness the full savagery of the Nazi regime. I was the first American officer in that cow after it was liberated. The commanding officer heard about this place called Dachau. He called me because of my religion and also because of the fact that I was the patrol platoon leader. And he pointed it out on the map and he says, get there as soon as you can, take the Jeep, and I win. And I see it every night of my life, right now, every night. By May 1945, peace in Europe seemed close Adolf Hitler had committed suicide, and Berlin, capital of the Third Reich, had fallen to Soviet troops. Allied forces were fanning out across the remains of the Third Reich, encountering pockets of resistance, but also managing the many thousands of prisoners, hoping to chance their luck with the Western Allies instead of the Soviets. The Germans were surrendering en masse, thousands, not hundreds, but thousands at a time. We knew war was going to be over very shortly. The Screaming Eagles picked their way through southern Germany, close to the border with Austria. The going was slow. Allied commanders were fearful of ambushes. There were many diehards, SS units, Fallschirmjäger, and also the Nazis' own resistance movement, the Werewolves, um, who, although not a, a totally functioning guerrilla movement, were still capable uh, of causing casualties. Fortunately, Allied fears did not materialize, and aside from isolated pockets, no guerrilla movement developed. Rather than focus on clearing Nazi fanatics from the mountains, the Screaming Eagles were more interested in beating rival Allied units to claim the ultimate prize, Hitler's private hideaway, the Eagle's Nest. The Eagle's Nest had huge symbolism simply because it was in effect, Hitler's home from home. This was where so much of the, the, the propaganda photos and films of the Nazi dictator had been made. So for the first Allied unit to get there, to capture it, was a hugely symbolically important moment. By May 1945, rival Allied units were all racing to capture Berchtesgaden. There's even evidence that German soldiers were trying to reach the town. However, on the 4th of May, the honor fell to the US 7th Infantry Regiment. Little known, but battle-hardened, they'd been in almost continuous combat for months. 
Soon after, men from the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment relieved them. Bert just got Hitler's mountain retreat. This had been a playground for Hitler and his cronies. But now it's under new management, and we're getting our first real break for some sightseeing. The number one attraction is Hitler's eagle nest, a very proper spot for the screaming eagles to finally come to rest. The attractive thing to me was this patio-like thing that Hitler had made, and you're overlooking these beautiful mountains, and it's just a beautiful place. For the men of the 101st, it was time to acquire a few souvenirs. I brought back a bottle of cognac set for the freer's use only, and I brought back 14 pistols. I told the men, when you get into Germany, you can take anything you want, anything except a life. In fact, I took one of Hitler's automobiles. I personally had one of his automobiles. You could fire an M1 rifle at the windows, and it would just go almost through it, but not all the way through it, if you had, unless you had armored piercing. Now, see, who would believe that if I told them? But it's true. In the weeks and months after the fall of Germany, most of the 101st began to head home. After fighting in some of the most pivotal battles of the Second World War, they would finally get to see their loved ones again. My mother and the whole family, they were waiting for me when I got to the Union Station in Norfolk, Virginia, and said hello to everyone, hugged them. At the time this program was made, Ed Shames was still going strong at 98 years old. But many of his comrades were not so lucky. After 214 days in combat, the Screaming Eagles had lost over 2,000 men, with a further 8,000 wounded and almost 1,200 missing in action. This band of brothers had proven their worth in battle and written themselves into the history books as one of the US military's most fearsome units. Throughout World War II, one unit came to define elite military excellence in the American army. This big German cut loose with a submachine gun and he killed my second in command. We got the guy and put him away. Superb warriors pushed to the limits in the most difficult missions ever conceived. The first third and fourth ranger battalions were practically wiped out. From assaulting African beaches, to clearing the mountains of Italy, and scaling French cliffs. We was under all kind of fire. They was coming on us pretty fast. Always leading the way, they are the US Army's first special forces. The Rangers. An extraordinary war demanded extraordinary soldiers. Well, we were good. We were very good. The best there was. Forged into elite bands of brothers. You were fighting for your buddy. You didn't want to let them down by facing the trials of war together. They attacked us up through the vapor trails and butchered us up pretty good. These are the stories of the Second World War's most famous fighting formations and their journey through tragedy and triumph. The German commander said, I've never seen any people as brave as yours. To earn their battle honors. The 30th of January, 1944. Cisterna, in the Italian hills. The men of the US Army Rangers approach with great stealth. What they do not know is that the armored units of the battle-hardened Hermann Goering Panzer Division lie in wait. Suddenly, uh, all hell broke loose. 
We had some poor intelligence reports, and there were more troops around than we had anticipated. The Americans have walked into an ambush. The Germans just let them come, and then they just took the whole unit. They already enjoyed a hard-won reputation for courage and skill. But now the Rangers are cut off, surrounded by tanks and fighting for their lives. This will be the defining moment in their war. When America entered the global conflict in December 1941, their army lacked any special forces. Britain's experience had proven the value of elite, hard-hitting soldiers. A new American unit would be modeled on the superb British commandos. Running, jumping, rough and ready soldiers of our army's commando-like rangers rushed through an obstacle course designed for real toughness. The reputation of the US Army Rangers is the elite of the elite. They are regarded by people both in and out of the military as being the epitome of what a soldier can be. The kind of training that makes men soldiers and the kind of soldiers who win their fights. The US Army Rangers are at the cutting edge, at the forefront. They are to, to either carry out small-scale raids, to hit tactically or strategically important targets, and to undertake the kind of missions that normal infantry units would struggle to do. Only the very best soldiers were invited to join this new crack unit. This outfit requires a high type of soldier with excellent character who is not averse to seeing dangerous action. All volunteers must be athletically inclined, have good stamina, and be mentally adapted for making quick decisions in the face of unforeseen circumstances. A ranger is someone who has complete confidence in his abilities, who has the knowledge that he needs to survive in practically any situation. I think he has the pride that he is one of the very few soldiers who have achieved a pinnacle of excellence. My buddy, Jack, came around one day and he says, hey, they're looking for volunteers to take some commando training. And uh, I said, well, what do I got to do? He says, well, you don't have any do anything. He says, I already signed you up. For weeks, 2,000 infantrymen went through a grueling selection process at Carrick Fergus in Northern Ireland. It's physically extremely demanding. It really does seek to get them to a peak of uh, physical stamina and endurance. They were put through their paces. This was really about distance, travel, with weight, and then carrying out exercises. At the US Army Rangers Museum in Carrick Fergus, Sheeran Murphy curates a collection of original Rangers artifacts. Among them are letters donated by Private Bob Reed, one of the original 2000 volunteers. Bob Reed was an army medic from Canandaigua, New York and he found himself in Northern Ireland in early 1942, and he decided to try out for the Rangers. He donated a number of items to the museum, some fantastic letters describing his experiences. And he talks about how it became very important for him to make it, to become a Ranger. It may have become a matter of pride, Every day, a list was posted of men who were to be RTU'd, returned to unit. They failed to make the cut. He talks about checking the lists every day to see, you know, was he still in? It suddenly become really important to him that he make it through and that he become a ranger. To be on that list, to be publicly pointed out and named as not being good enough, not being up to the mark, is a difficult one for anyone to take. You know, it, it's failing your driving test, it, failing a, a school exam. It's, it's failure. Bob Reed was one of the 600 who passed selection for an elite unit that still had no name. Well, we thought a lot of different things about Raiders and everything, and then someone spoke up and says, hey, why not 
named it after Rogers Rangers. Well, everyone voted on it, and that's so we came up with the first Ranger Battalion. The history of the Rangers uh, can be traced all the way back to 1751. An officer in New Hampshire named Robert Rogers formed a militia group that was part of the British Army when it colonized what's today the United States. They could ambush the enemy. Uh, they could show up where they weren't expected. Uh, and I think that was the model for when the Rangers were formed for World War II. On the 19th of June, 1942, in Carrick Fergus, the first Ranger Battalion of the US Army was officially activated by its new commanding officer, Captain William Orlando Darby. Darby was a graduate of West Point. He was a very likable person. He had strong leadership qualities. He firmly saw what the ethos of the British commandos and therefore a newly created Army Ranger unit for the, for the Americans, you know, what that could bring. Now transferred to the British commando training site in Achnacarry, Scotland, the real challenge began. The training was just hellacious. They trained seven days a week from before dawn until after sunset. They were run ragged, mainly by uh, British commandos, who openly questioned whether they were up to it and put them under an awful lot of psychological pressure. The level only intensified as their first action approached. We have this example in the collection. This is a training schedule. It doesn't date from that early period, the period in Achnacarry in Scotland. It's a bit later. It actually dates from October 1943 during the Italian campaign. But it still gives us an idea of the kinds of activities that were taking place. Physical fitness, weapons familiarity, small unit tactics, speed marches, five miles an hour in full pack, log drills, think Highland Scottish games, hand-to-hand -hand combat, obstacle courses that required um, a lot of stamina. And finally, when you're completely exhausted, then came the ferocious bayonet training. So this example, it only shows us Thursday, Friday and Saturday. And you can see it's divided up into 15 minute increments. And we can see a lot of letters here and we have a key to these. So the X is for duty company and the I, articles of war. We have a few Ds down here, eight mile march, the Qs, a uh, mortar range, B, six mile march, the Gs are close order drill, J is Morse code, and then finally R um, is obstacle course. So it was a very intense training, and during all that, they complained about the food. Tom Sullivan's diary, he talks about the food. He says, food, wholesome but scarce, no seasoning, tea, fish, porridge, Prunes with cornstarch seems to be the chief diet. Mess officer has the temerity to ask if we like it. So it was a very intense training period. The training had been brutal. One recruit even died in a live fire exercise. But in August 1942, the Rangers were ready for action. After well over a year of fighting the mass Nazi invasion of Soviet Russia, Stalin now demanded Allied help to relieve the pressure. In the summer of 1942, Dieppe, a critical French port, was targeted for an amphibious raid. It was decided by the Allies that they needed to run, well, I'd, I'd call it a, a test invasion. Basically, it was to, to test German defenses. It was to teach the Allied invasion planners what would be necessary for a successful large-scale invasion. A raid grew to epic proportions with nearly 5,000 Canadian troops and over 1,000 British, supported by more than 230 warships and 74 Allied squadrons, now joined by 50 US Army Rangers, the first Americans to see ground combat in Europe. The Rangers were attached to the British No. 4 Commando, 
and Orange Beach became their designated landing point. The Rangers would help to neutralize six 150 millimeter guns. The combined force landed near the battery, advancing under intense fire before destroying the artillery pieces. Less than three hours after landing, they withdrew. Their part of the raid had been a success. The rest quickly became a disaster. A surprise was lost when the landing fleet was engaged by a passing German convoy and hidden clifftop guns. The bodies of the British and Canadian troops were piled high. It was a disaster, especially if you ask any Canadians. I don't think they really accomplished uh, much other than just putting a scare into the Germans. Among the 5,000 Canadian troops, there was a shocking casualty rate of almost 70%. The commandos lost a quarter of their men, and the Rangers suffered the first official American combat casualty of the war in Europe. But lessons were learned, particularly the need for a mass shore bombardment before amphibious assaults, and the effectiveness of targeted special forces. All new units need success. They need to prove why they have been established. Why have we been created? And the ability even for a small number of men to take part in Dieppe, to take part in, in the, the, the most successful part of that operation, um, was gold dust. Being a ranger quickly became a badge of honor. And the collection at the Rangers Museum in Northern Ireland shows how that pride now took a physical form. Dieppe was a disaster, but it was also highly publicized first aggression. And so it was being talked about back in the UK. And apparently fights broke out in pubs um, between, well, between Rangers, between those who had been there and those who hadn't. And so something had to be done. And so Darby arranged a competition, arranged a prize for the winner, and it was won by Sergeant Anthony Rada. And so this is the winning design here. And you can see some variations here. Often they were locally made and, and a little bit crude, um, and there was no standardization. And so after Dieppe, the Rangers were authorized to wear the shoulder scrolls on their left shoulder. This is the Rangers badge of honor. This is something that says they were a ranger, they were there. The Rangers new badge came without heraldry, no lions, eagles or daggers. For them, it was all in the name, the Rangers. What it means to be a US Army Ranger is you are one of a relative few, you know, a few hundred men. And it also means that you join a tradition um, which stretches back all the way to, to the foundation stones of America. Their next battle honor would come in November 1942, in the heat of North Africa, a targeted operation to take out another heavily defended gun battery part of the Allied invasions to liberate North Africa, controlled by the Vichy French, clients of the Nazis. It became important for the Americans to knock out the French guns so that the other landing craft and, and support ships could come into the harbor, which was the perfect assignment for them because they were small enough to go in, make a hit and run raid before the French even knew what was happening. A textbook special forces mission and another praise winning success. As the allies pushed further into Northern Africa, the Rangers were always at the forefront. Darby and his men liked to conduct night raids when they could close in on an enemy position without them 
knowing about it. By early 1943, they had even started to terrify their Axis foes. Derby's next target was Senate Railway Station, a key outpost in Tunisia, and base for the elite 10th Versaglieri Regiment. They were the cream of the Italian infantry, almost to say they were the rangers of the Italian army. So, you know, the rangers were going up against, you know, some of the best troops that the Italians had to offer. To be effective, special forces such as rangers need compact small arms that pack a mighty punch, even if borrowed from Chicago's gangsters. Many of the rangers in the raid were equipped with the Thompson submachine gun, or Tommy gun, which had been around since 1918 and was now used by the military. Firing 600 rounds per minute with great stopping power, it proved perfect for the rangers' close combat tactics. Before they set out, Captain Roy Murray told his men, They've got to know that they've been worked over by rangers. Every man is to use his bayonet as much as he can. Those are our orders. It was going to be an all-night overland march on foot to sneak up on the enemy. One of the Italian sentries heard the men coming. Well, that was kind of the signal for the rangers to charge. We swarmed over them, grenading, bayoneting, shooting, screaming. The Italians never had a chance. We worked them over furiously, giving no quarter. It was sickening, brutal, inhuman. From that time on, the Italians referred to the Rangers as the Black Death because of the, the black caps they wore and the fact that they had blackened their, their faces. And there was a, a real fear uh, among Italian troops, and I think Germans as well, that the Black Death was coming to get them. They really start building this legend of the Rangers, this idea of getting close with the enemy, um, of, of not killing them at a distance, but, but, you know, grabbing them by the belt buckle and physically ramming a bayonet into their guts. The Rangers quickly killed dozens of Italians and lost one man. This wasn't just a raid, it was a rout. Derby was awarded the Silver Star with 11 other Rangers. And by May 1943, their victories had convinced the US Army to expand the Ranger force. The early successes that the Rangers had led the American authorities to believe that this was a way to go, that this was a force that could provide them with some real cutting edge. This was a time to expand on what worked. We've got one Ranger battalion, great, let's form another, the second, let's form another, the third, the fourth, the fifth. The new second and fifth Ranger battalions began training in the US with the expanded 1st, 3rd and 4th now targeting Sicily. On the 10th of July, 1943, they landed at Gela, leading the 7th US Army's invasion of the island. Now preceded by a vast shore barrage, one of the hard-won lessons from Dieppe. I never realized naval gunfire could be so accurate. In every battery position, we found at least one gun with a direct hit and at least one stack of ammunition blown. Facing stiff opposition on Italian soil, they cleared the coastal defenses, stormed Gela, and defeated armored counterattacks with great prowess. We were under all kind of fire. Stay close to the ground that you could. We really didn't have time to dig in because they was coming on us pretty fast. United as Force X, 
The Rangers became the shock troops for the drive through Sicily. Just over a month later, they prepared to land to the south of Naples. Now to secure the western flank of a mass amphibious assault at Salerno. The Rangers replicated um, exactly what they'd done um, in Sicily and in French North Africa beforehand. They're there for specific targets, shore batteries, airfields, important bridges, traffic junctions. That's where they need the Rangers to be. So key points that are going to help their ongoing land forces behind them move faster into the interior. I was in misery most of the time. Aside from trying to lead others and trying to keep their minds from cracking up, it was hell for me as well as everyone else. Tired, hungry, cold, hot, just misery. First time in combat, I didn't know what the hell was going on. And this big German cut loose with a submachine gun. And he, he killed my second in command. He was right behind me. We got the guy and put him away. Brutal experience quickly expanded their skill set to taking mountain passes and even towns. Private Bob Reed was one of many rangers who received commendations for their service in Italy. This is his silver star here, which we have on display in the museum. And this is the letter that he wrote home to his family telling them about it. And he's a bit vague and a bit cryptic in the letter. He says, um, you'll probably get some notice from the War Department, so this enclosure will let you know what it's all about. And then at the end of the letter, he says, please don't write to me at this address until you hear from me and get a new one, as I am being transferred again to a much better place, by the way. As it turns out, Italy would be Private Reed's last frontline campaign. At the time, he couldn't really say where he was going or what he was doing because of censorship. Um, but later on, he has added his own notes to the letter. So he circled notice and he's put award a silver star. And when he talks about to a much better place, he's referring to coming home. He's written USA. Lieutenant Colonel Darby was praised for leading a mixed Allied force, as well as the Rangers. This is dated 21st of September, 1943, and it's a letter commending him for his actions at Salerno in Italy. So it says, uh, I wish to express to you my unqualified commendation for the remarkable battle leadership you have shown in your operations north of Salerno. Given a command consisting of a number of different British and American units, which had never previously served together, you speedily made of them a smoothly operating force, which demonstrated by its deeds its ability to defeat the enemy opposed to it. You have fully appreciated the importance of your mission, and you have accomplished it in a magnificent way, which reflects credit not only upon yourself and the men of your command, but on the American military service in general. You and the members of your command have the genuine gratitude of the officers and men of the 5th Army for the splendid job you are doing. And it's signed by Mark W. Clark, Lieutenant General, USA. The Rangers had achieved remarkable feats for a tiny force, but a truly devastating danger now faced them in the mountains near a small town called Cisterna. In January 1944, the Allies targeted Anzio with another overambitious amphibious landing. Its aim was to flank the Gustav Line. Reinforced positions that blocked their advance. It was a very, very heavily fortified uh, defensive set of fortifications that used the best of Italy's geography. The mountain ranges, the difficulties of terrain, the steepness of the ravines, the fast flowing rivers and so on to make it almost impossible to get through. So their view was, if you can't go through it, go round it. A vast armada assembled for the landings. And as they had done in Algeria and again in Sicily, the rangers led the way. 
The beachhead went relatively easy the first two days until they realized what had happened, and then we got a lot of resistance. The Germans reacted very quickly, using a significant force to trap the Allies in the landing zone. We were on the beachhead from the 22nd of January until the 30th of January, when the 1st, 3rd, and 4th Ranger Battalion went through the enemy lines. To lead the breakout, the Rangers infiltrated towards Cisterna, led by the 1st and 3rd Battalions, with the 4th as reinforcements. That was our object, to capture Cisternia, which had a road that was going south that was critical for the Germans. But as they advanced, the 4th immediately ran into trouble. As the 1st and 3rd were hit by the Hermann Göring Panzer Division. The Germans were bringing up strong forces, uh, in particular armored forces, and those were looking to strike a blow and drive the Americans back into the sea. Uh, and the two met head on. When we got on the outskirts of Cisternia, we did get that far. Suddenly, uh, all hell broke loose. We had some poor intelligence reports, and there were more troops around than we had anticipated. They didn't realize that the Germans had somehow gotten wind of uh, this attack. And so the Rangers were ambushed as they moved towards Cisterna. And it was, a, it was a terrible fight. The Rangers were attacking the Panzers and knocking them out. There was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Rangers were just torn to shreds. I heard something coming down the mountain. It hit my arm, my left arm, and went off. It's a grenade. Casualties mounted as ammunition dwindled. The 1st and 3rd Rangers were now surrounded as the 4th made increasingly desperate attempts to break through the Panzers. The Rangers fought heroically. They did not turn tail and run. They did not give up. They held out literally until their ammunition was gone. But when it was gone, they were surrounded. They had no hope of relief. Their fellow Americans tried to get through to them, but there was no way that was going to be achieved. They never got there. The Germans just let them come, and then they just took the whole unit. The 1st, 3rd, and 4th Ranger battalions were practically wiped out, either killed or taken prisoner. As each radio went silent, Colonel Darby realized that his force had been overwhelmed, uh, over 700 men were either killed or taken prisoner in this operation. And uh, he just put his head down on, on his arms and cried because of so many of his men who were lost. Uh, and this was basically the end of the, of the Rangers in Italy and, uh, and Darby's association with them. Of his 767 men, in the 1st and 3rd Rangers, only six managed to escape death or capture. The battered 4th Battalion was now broken up, a sad end to an illustrious band of brothers. I was with Colonel Darby when the 1st and 3rd were lost. I watched a great man break down. I saw defeat within a soul of one whom I had great respect and admiration. I have never seen a person so dejected and defeated. Now it was left to the untested 2nd and 5th battalions to carry the Rangers' war in the European theater. Since 1943, they had been training in the United States and then England for what would be the largest seaborne invasion ever launched, D-Day. On the 6th of June, 1944, over 150,000 Allied troops would land on the beaches of Normandy. 
This was the major push to open up a Western front and liberate Europe. But a huge threat loomed over the American landing zone. Between the US Omaha and Utah beaches was a promontory called Point de Hoc, a fortified bunker complex that housed six huge 155 millimeter guns. They sat atop a sheer 30 meter cliff in range of the beaches and the vulnerable landing craft. They couldn't trust that air power or naval gunfire would do the job and it would take boots on the ground to do it. Point de Hoc is part of Hitler's massive Atlantic wall defenses, running all along the French coast. For any unit to try and take such an objective was seen as incredibly difficult. Uh, and so the, the call went out, let's give it to the Rangers. Point de Hoc had a shingle beach that was barely 20 yards across below it. And then it had, in effect, vertical cliffs all the way up about 100 feet. And then on the top, they were crowned with barbed wire, mines. And then once on top there, you could actually fight your way through the battery position, where there were pillboxes, machine gun positions. This seemingly impossible task fell to three companies of the 2nd Rangers, led by Lieutenant Colonel James Rudder. Early on the morning of the 6th of June, the Rangers boarded their Royal Navy landing craft and set out for the cliffs. You were ready to go. You didn't have a fear at that time. You were you're thinking, boy, this is what we want. That's what we're here for, for your train for. Rudder led 225 men in the landing craft. You couldn't see anything, you know, and the guys would want to stick their head up and see what's going on. And they always told us to keep your heads down, you know. And then all of a sudden it becomes silent. There was no, no talking at all. As the Allied warships and rocket launchers battled against the vast shore defenses, the larger second wave of Rangers remained offshore waiting for the signal from Rudder's men to join them. But then 115 RAF Lancaster bombers hit Point de Hoc with over 600 tons of bombs. And Rudder's rangers realized they were in the wrong place. They had drifted off course and had to sail back to the small beach below Point de Hoc. We got lost. We were supposed to land on one side of the point, and they did get lost. To help scale the 30-meter cliffs, the Rangers' landing craft were equipped with rocket launchers to fire steel grapnel hooks. Two-inch rockets shot from six J projectors, launching a combination of ropes and rope ladders up the cliffs backed up by portable units on the beach. They shot them up, and then some guys would go up this rough area, which would probably be maybe 25, 30 feet, and then they would have ladders from there going the rest of the way. But the ladders were so small and so narrow that it wasn't too practical. fighting their way up these ladders and ropes with Germans shooting down on them, throwing grenades. I have no idea how anybody made it to the top. But eventually, after several long, bloody minutes, uh, the first Rangers got to the top and began crawling over and engaging the Germans up there. Thought of climbing a rope for 100 feet up a cliff, that's difficult enough. To do that whilst carrying all your weapons and equipment with people shooting at you from above is a truly remarkable feat. And we all had to get up there as soon as possible, so we went up pretty fast. Within 15 minutes or so, I think that we were mostly all up there. By the time they got to the top, they had, I believe, 
90 men, the rest had, had been lost. And over the next few days, they were down to 30 or 40 men. So they, they had taken terrible attrition. But despite this appalling cost, the surviving rangers were horrified to find the huge gun emplacements empty. The incredible thing was that the Germans had moved the guns in the days before the invasion with a view to upgrading the Point de Hoc facility as a military site. So 2nd Battalion spread out, continued to move forward to establish a foothold and came across the guns in an orchard and there they, they, they destroyed them. So they did carry out their objective. That gun battery was nullified and it was a hugely successful operation, although perhaps not how they'd originally intended. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Colonel Schneider led the rest of the 2nd Battalion and all of the 5th Rangers. They had been waiting for the signal to reinforce the attack. We were circling. My Colonel Schneider says, I don't see any red flares. 6 o'clock comes, 6.15, no red flares. So that told us that the Colonel in the 2nd Battalion had been successful in climbing the cliff. So now we went over and we were going to hit Omaha Beach. My colonel is the only one that has binoculars. He's the only one that's been in combat. I'm standing right behind him. He looks on the beach and he says, oh, damn. He says, this is the hottest beach I've ever seen. I mean, we were going right into these 88s and machine guns. Schneider's force comprised two units from the 2nd Battalion. One hit a heavily defended part of Omaha Beach, soon after the 29th Infantry Division. By the time they reached the cliffs, over half these rangers were casualties. If you've seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, you get an idea of what the intensity of the combat situation was when they hit the beach. Total chaos, uh, people dying left and right, being torn in half by munitions, total confusion, nobody knows where they are. The other company had it even worse. Of their 68 rangers, only 27 reached the limited shelter of the sea wall, just up the beach. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Colonel Schneider and the 5th Rangers entered the maelstrom. The scene on the beach was almost unbelievable. Shells of all kinds were hitting the water's edge. Dead and wounded lay in the water and across the sand. Those that could struggled to crawl out of the water before the advancing tide. On all sides, the wounded were screaming for medics. The survivors rallied, and when the 29th Brigadier General Cota heard they were rangers, he issued his most famous order. Well, goddammit, then. Rangers, lead the way. So the rangers set off, uh, and the rest of the 29th Division decided to follow them because they were rangers, and they evidently knew what they were doing. They were the main troops with a 5th Ranger Battalion, which was coming from the east, led by Brigadier General Norman Dakota, who was the bravest man that I ever saw in my life. Very, very brave. Still a coherent force, the 5th Rangers quickly deployed in a typically aggressive manner, storming the overlooking cliffs with their deadly gun emplacements and helping to rally the battered 29th Division. One of the reasons that the US Army Rangers excelled is the ability for the individuals within it to think for themselves. When things are unexpected, to adapt to those circumstances. The individuals are units that, that do that and do that successfully, that mark themselves out. Uh, and that, that is one of the cornerstones of, of, of range success. The rangers led the way for just under three kilometers to the town of virville sur mer where they helped resist the heavy German counterattacks. 
the Allies had won a foothold in France, but at a great cost. We know after the head count, they usually take a head count, you know, after things settle down, that we were short quite a few. Between the 6th and the 8th of June, nearly half of the 2nd Ranger Battalion became casualties. At Point de Hoc, they lost 135 of the 225 men. Throughout the Normandy campaign, the Rangers remained in action and then fought their way through northern France and into Belgium. They were instrumental in taking one of the key French ports at the Battle of Brest. But by late 1944, the Allied advance stumbled against a massive natural barrier, the Hertgen Forest. A thickly wooded area along the border between Belgium and Germany, it's part of the Siegfried Line and one of the Nazi strongholds in defenses stretching more than 600 kilometers. The forest was dominated by a natural feature that loomed over the surrounding landscape, rising for hundreds of meters, Hill 400. Because it was high ground, it gave the ability for observers to bring down accurate artillery fire on the land below it. The Germans had garrisoned it and, and fighting had been toing and froing over it for weeks. The Americans determined to take it uh, and the, the Rangers were the, the, the perfect uh, you know, vehicle for that. Over the preceding three months, this brutal meat grinder had chewed up several infantry units. Another impossible job for the Rangers. They were given the assignment because uh, they were small enough unit, they could close with the position without attracting a lot of attention. So they moved up uh, through the woods and uh, made the assault on this particular position, which was heavily fortified. There were bunkers up there, there were machine gun positions. Uh, the Germans were not going to let this go easily. With some of Hitler's most experienced veterans ready to counterattack. Fallschirmjägers, the German paratroops, were, to, were you know, as, as tough as any of the elite forces that the Americans and British had. It was a very difficult attack. A number of Rangers were killed or wounded. The Germans would counterattack as the Rangers took over certain areas of Hill 400. The Germans would fall back and then attack them again. Counterattacks on Hill all afternoon. Very heavy artillery. Only 25 able bodied men left. Help needed badly. Are surrounded. Over two days, the Germans launched several brutal counterattacks. But the Rangers held until relieved by the US 8th Infantry Division. It had been a bloody battle. But where others had failed, the Rangers had succeeded in capturing and holding the most strategically important point in the Hurtgen Forest. They then took up their role as the tip of the spear, leading the way into the Nazi heartland. Whenever there was a pocket of resistance that was encountered on the route of march, the rangers were generally the ones who were sent up front to uh, take care of that uh, pocket and wipe it out. Now attached to different US infantry divisions, the rangers provided an elite rapid response capability. There was a concern that the Nazis would set up a defiant last ridout in the Alps, and that there were tens of thousands of, of diehard SS troops who would be based there with the latest weaponry, uh, and the fighting could go on for years. The feared Nazi guerrilla resistance never materialized. And by the time VE Day came in May 1945, what remained of the Rangers had reached Czechoslovakia. And their founding father, 
Colonel Darby had already left the Pentagon to rejoin the fight. Typical of the man that, that even then, um, he was constantly badgering um, his superiors to, to get back over to Europe and get back in the fight. In March 1945, he returned to Italy and led Task Force Derby, formed from the US 10th Mountain Division. But barely a week before the end of the war, as he addressed his men, a German shell burst nearby, killing William Orlando Darby. So this is a letter dated 5th of May, 1945, and it's sent to Darby's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Percy W. Darby, uh, and it's concerning their son's death. Now, at this stage, they already are aware that their son has been killed, but this is a follow-up letter which aims to give them some more detail on what had happened. So we can only imagine what it was like for them, desperate to know what had happened to their son. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Darby, I am writing to you concerning your son, Colonel William O. Darby. I fully realise the distress you have suffered since receiving the sad announcement of your son's death, and I know you are anxious to learn any details which may become available regarding his death. An additional report has now been received in the War Department which states that Colonel Darby was killed in action in Italy on the 30th of April 1945. You have my heartfelt sympathy in your bereavement. Yours sincerely, J.A. Julio. Shortly after his death, Darby was posthumously promoted to the rank of Brigadier General by President Truman. His legacy with the Rangers is difficult to measure. Would the US Rangers have even existed in the Second World War without him? Perhaps. Um, would they have achieved anything like what they did? I, I doubt. Leaders like Darby are rare. He really did lead from the front and help inspire the reputation which the Rangers hold to this day. A truly inspirational leader. Darby created a special ops unit that rose from obscurity to legend, suffering an appalling rate of attrition in some of the toughest fighting against Hitler. And today, over 75 years on from their humble beginnings in Northern Ireland, the Rangers still lead the way for the US Army. The Rangers are still considered the elite of the elite, they are looked upon as the men you call on when you need to have a dirty job done, who are deployed whenever a quick action strike force is necessary anywhere in the world. In the deadly skies over war-torn Europe, one unit led America's fight with Hitler. They lost over half of their aircraft and hundreds of their air crew members. Daring aerial warriors who sacrificed all to destroy the Nazi war machine. I also saw some of them going nose down. I didn't know if the pilots were dead. Germany was ready for it and they made it rough. Relentlessly attacking deep into the heart of the Reich. We're on the IP. No matter the odds or cost. Bombs away. Got an engine that's struggling. It's on fire. It exploded. Nine men gone just that quick. They are the 8th US Army Air Force. The mighty 8th. Extraordinary war demanded extraordinary soldiers. Well, we were good. We were very good. The best there was. Forged into elite bands of brothers. You were fighting for your buddy. You didn't want to let them down. 
by facing the trials of war together. They attacked us up through the vapor trails and butchered us up pretty good. These are the stories of the Second World War's most famous fighting formations and their journey through tragedy and triumph. The German commander said, I've never seen any people as brave as yours. To earn their battle honors. By late 1943, the tide of war had begun to turn in the Allies' favor, except in the air over Europe. For months, hundreds of B-17s battled to penetrate Hitler's defenses during the daytime, paying a terrible price in men and machines. The losses were terrific. In the first raids, they lost over half of their aircraft and hundreds of their air crew members. So you can imagine how bad it was. Not protected by fighter escorts. Get that one in three. And under relentless attack, they often failed to destroy key targets. We had two planes to collide in midair. We lost two planes that morning. The mighty eighth would learn brutal lessons until one week in February, 1944, when everything changed and the battle for air superiority took a decisive turn. The 8th U.S. Army Air Force was activated on the 28th of January, 1942, in Savannah, Georgia. And as 8th Bomber Command, they gradually deployed to Great Britain that spring. The U.S. Air Forces were still part of the American Army and not yet independent. When we talk about the mighty 8th, we're talking about the U.S. 8th Air Force which really carried the heavy end of the stick in bombings of Nazi Germany and German-controlled territory in World War II, along with the Royal Air Force Bomber Command. Hundreds and then thousands of men quickly trained to master heavy bombers, such as the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. I guess there's no way they can prepare a, a young man for combat. <laughs> we didn't have the remotest idea what we were headed into. One of the captains told us, he said, well, we can teach you everything here except the extreme cold at altitude. Air power would revolutionize warfare during the Second World War. And the Mighty Eighth would eventually take things to an epic new scale of destruction. It was something that took a while of trial and error to determine that the aircraft could actually be an instrument of war and be a very powerful one. In less than four decades, aircraft had gone from a glorified kite to fragile fighters. And then a weapon of mass destruction. They brought the full devastating power of modern warfare to ordinary people's front doors. Hitler's bombers first terrorized continental Europe. And then, from 1940 into 1941, blitzed British cities, killing more than 43,000 civilians. 
the evolution of aerial warfare had, had given war a, a, another dimension. It meant that you could hit the enemy far, far behind the front line. The factories that, that made the tanks, that made the planes, that made the bullets. And if you could choke that off, you could hopefully end the war early. From mid-1942, the 8th started to arrive in Britain, and a trickle became a flood as RAF stations joined the Union with Uncle Sam. This is the new battlefront, the air front, from which we seek out the enemy, the power behind the German lust for conquest, the steel mills and refineries, shipyards and submarine pens, factories and munitions plants, pinpoints on the map of Europe which mean rubber, guns, ball bearing, shells, engines, planes, tanks, Targets, targets to be destroyed. One airbase became schools by 1944, spreading from the English Midlands to East Anglia. And a handful of squadrons eventually became three bombardment divisions. The first and the third divisions were B-17, the Flying Fortress, and the second division was primarily B-24s. The two bombers uh, were different yet similar. Uh, each bomber had a crew of 10. Uh, the B-24 could carry more bombs and fly a little bit farther than the B-17. The 17s could fly higher and could take a lot more damage in the air than the B-24 could. We'll be hitting the Leal area and the lowland. But eight months after Pearl Harbor, the 8th B-17s had still not dropped a single bomb in anger. On the 17th of August, 1942, that would change. With a planned attack on Rouen's railway marshalling yards in northern France. The 8th's bomber commander, Brigadier General Ira Eker, flew in one of the dozen B 17s. But this initial mission was not about destruction, it was the first test of the American strategic doctrine daylight precision bombing. Our theory that day bombardment is feasible is about to be tested when men's lives are put at stake. We made landfall at precisely the point indicated in our flight plan. Our planes were in excellent formation, but perhaps not quite as tight as would have been ideal for protection against enemy attacks. The conditions on a B-17 on a mission were at best, terrible. Once you get up into altitude, you have no oxygen. So everybody's on an oxygen bottle. They have a mask on. Uh, it's very cold, 40, 50 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Everybody is wearing, in the early stages of the war, a, a leather jacket that's fleece lined. And it's very heavy, and they've got heavy fleece lined gloves and heavy fleece lined boots. There were no bathrooms on the plane, so the crews were furnished with a relief tube. You can stand next to somebody and shout in their ear, and you will not hear them. Uh, so all the crew were hooked into headphones and microphones. The most vulnerable aircraft was always tail end Charlie. And the worst job in the air was being its rear gunner. Sergeant Adam Jenkins watched as his nightmare approached. There were eight of them in V formation. The leader waggled his wings and came for us. When they were about 300 yards away, I pulled the trigger and it looked like the end of his wings came off. Major Paul Tibbetts piloted one of the pioneering aircraft. He would later pilot another to drop the atom bomb on Hiroshima. 
our aim was reasonably good, but you couldn't describe it as pinpoint bombing. We were no longer novices at this terrible game of war. We had braved the enemy in his own skies and were alive to tell about it. They all returned safely, partly because four squadrons of RAF Spitfires provided a close escort. But this American plan horrified the British, who had already rejected daylight bombing because of the terrible losses. The RAF had been bombing the Reich for well over two years, but largely at night. With the advent of the U.S. 8th Air Force, the bombing campaign became more of a around-the-clock campaign. The British RAF would bomb at night, and in the daytime, the 8th Air Force would come over. Churchill, as the Prime Minister, was looking at, how can I assuage public opinion in the UK and hit back at Germany? How can I do that? Fighting in North Africa is so far away from Germany. The only way is by dropping bombs on German soil. The British Bomber Boys, led by Sir Arthur Bomber Harris, aimed to destroy industry and morale. But their night ops forced the inaccurate area bombing of cities. However, the Americans advocated the precision targeting of factories, which required daylight. They argued that the heavily armed B-17 could defend itself. It was, after all, named the Flying Fortress. The B-17s bristled with up to 13 Browning machine guns. Below, above, at the sides, and to the rear. But the huge weight of all that firepower often limited their practical payload to two tons, far less than the regular drop of RAF Lancasters. Over 12,000 were built in another production miracle. The whole idea was that the B-17 could fly unescorted by fighters and that it would get relatively quickly to any target within Europe, be able to protect itself, drop its payload, and then get back home. But theory met brutal reality as the flying fortresses confronted the most terrifying air force ever seen, the Luftwaffe. In 42, the Luftwaffe still was a very powerful force. They uh, pretty much ruled the skies over Europe. And the Germans were very skilled in their tactics in the air. They knew the best places to attack the bombers. Then, in late November 1942, the Luftwaffe unleashed a terrifying new tactic. Their fighters flew straight and level directly into the front of the B-17s, targeting the vulnerable Perspex nose cone. The German Focke-Wulf uh, fighter pilot is firing his 20 millimeter cannon at the uh, aircraft, trying to knock out the cockpit and kill the pilot and co-pilot. These in-air strikes further reduced their very limited impact on one key target, the fortified U-boat pens. While the worsening winter weather now cancelled many of the planned ops. Stuck on the ground, the American aviators turned to the little bit of home they had brought with them, the base PX shop. Trevor Hewitt runs the New Farm Aviation Heritage Group and is particularly proud of one of their museum's exhibits. Behind me on the wall here, we have the uh, post exchange sign or the PX shop sign. The sign itself has the 8th Air Force winged eight sign in it. 
Post Exchange was a very important place uh, on the base because uh, it's where they got together. The PX shop was well stocked. Cigarettes and uh, candy and various tins of peaches and other things, mainly American brands of stuff. So it was, it was comforts from home for them in the PX shop, a vital piece of uh, the infrastructure of the airfield. We are of a great belief that this was actually produced and painted by a local civilian, W. Cook. This PX sign is evidence of the bonds forming between these amiable invaders and the locals. The friendly soil of England, whose people have defended their island's freedom for over a thousand years. But today, their countryside has changed. Today, their island has been converted into a gigantic bomber field, a super aircraft carrier anchored off the shores of Fortress Europe with hangars and machine shops. One of the most romanticized views of the war is the perception of the flyers enjoying a bucolic lifestyle. Surrounded by charming farms, picture-perfect villages, cute churches, and flights of passing young women. For some, perhaps many of the American airmen, the reality was somewhat different. The living conditions when we got in there, they were poor, you know, and not much transportation, a few bicycles around for some people, uh, no way to get around. Uh, we lived in Nissen huts. There was no heat in there to speak of. One of the amusing things about uh, the arrival of the Americans was the, the phrase, overpaid, oversexed, and over here. There was, I think, a lot of resentment they remained two nations divided by a common language and different currencies. Remember, one pound is not one dollar, but four dollars. And that equals 20 shillings. I had nice times there, to tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, I used to go to the pub and we'd play uh, cribbage and we'd play uh, darts. We'd bring them eggs and butter. And we trade that for, they do our laundry for us. And they were lovely. The people were just lovely people. Of course, the Americans had more money than the British soldiers were being paid. Uh, they were seen as kind of the, the glamorous uh, group that had come in and they were stealing the, the English girls away from their uh, boyfriends. But when the English people saw the casualties that the 8th Air Force was taking. I think the attitudes changed. During their first 10 months, the 8th lost 188 bombers and 1,900 men. Any crews that survived 25 missions could return to America. Later, this was raised to 35. In 1943, they had less than a one in four chance. One of the first to qualify were the crew of the Memphis Bell, praised by Hollywood, the top brass, and the crown. But the pressure still piled on to hit the Nazis harder and far more often. In January 1943, Prime Minister Churchill and President Roosevelt met in Casablanca and eventually confirmed round-the-clock bombing. The progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial, and economic system, and the undermining of the morale of the German people. The later point-blank directive prioritized aircraft production and Luftwaffe fighters, which meant bombing Germany. But this created a huge problem for the 8th 
as their chubby P-47 Thunderbolt escorts could only fly as far as the German border. Exactly one year after their very first raid on Rouen, the 8th faced their greatest challenge on the 17th of August, 1943. Now with over 30 times as many planes in action, 376 B-17s. Massed to attack two key industrial areas deep inside Germany. But this huge force faced a mountain of obstacles, an exhausting flight duration, layers of anti-aircraft guns, and numerous squadrons of interceptors. To try and even up the odds, the Americans made an elaborate plan using two bombardment wings. Targeting Regensburg and Schweinfurt, the B group would closely shadow the A group for mutual protection. Once A bombed Regensburg, they would unexpectedly escape south to Allied bases in North Africa. But after B had hit Schweinfurt, they would have to battle their way back to Britain. All right, you dodos, let's go. This is it. The crews awoke at 1.30 in the morning to be briefed on the bad news, a massive mission through Hitler's heart of darkness. After takeoff and assembly, proceed up this line to this point. This will be your combat wing assembly line. You'll leave the coast. Confirming the route, rendezvous points, and the weather. The temperature at bombing altitude, minus 26 degrees centigrade. Some looked for divine protection. Others put their faith in flak aprons and their manganese steel plates. As the many forts taxied into position, their names, mottos, and good luck symbols were proudly displayed and freshly repainted. The pressure was on to prove American strategic bombing capabilities and deliver a knockout blow to Hitler. This would be the beginning of the end of the German war machine, or so we were informed by our S2 intelligence officer. Each man was pondering the odds of returning from a raid so deep into the Third Reich. Heavy mist delayed departure before the fourth bombardment wing broke through to find blue skies. But the flights of P-47 escorts quickly peeled away over Belgium. Regensburg was still 480 kilometers ahead. They were on their own. but only briefly. As the skies now filled with a hailstorm of diving and spinning Luftwaffe fighters. Watch that fighter coming at three o'clock. He's coming in on a half roll. Pull her up, Chief, pull her up. Hurry. The sight was fantastic and surpassed fiction. Here's one right behind him, Steve. I fought an impulse to close my eyes and overcame it. I knew that I was going to die, and so were a lot of others. Keep after him, Mitchell. I see him. I'm on him. I'm on you. I got him. I was very lucky, as you can see. <laughs> we went on a lot of tough missions. There was a plane right next to me. It just blew up. It was gone. It was scary. And the only time you would stop to think is when you see the plane going down, you know, and then you were counting the parachutes, you know, and hoping that they would get out. Keep your eye on them, Bill. 
See any parachutes, Quinlan? I also saw some of them going nose down. And I didn't know if the pilots were dead. And uh, Come on, get out of there. it was an ugly looking Five, thing. 10 o'clock. Watch those two at 12, Vin. They're coming in. They're coming in, Scotty. Get that ball turned out. You might even be shot by one of the neighboring B-17s, you know, their belly gunner. That might be tracking a German fighter, miss, and put a few rounds into you. And all of this while being tens of thousands of feet in the air. It, it must have been a truly horrifying experience. They tried to keep a rigid formation for mutual protection. Coming level to three. But it was broken up by the mounting losses. After 90 minutes under constant attack, they reached Regensburg. I knew that our bombardiers were grim as death while they synchronized their sights on the great Messerschmitt shops laying below us. Our bombs were away. On the regular raids, the anxious ground crews could only sweat out the mission in Britain. Flares would signal the return of damaged planes and those carrying casualties. We were over Germany. And the pilot says, we have to abort the mission. I'm having trouble with the engines. We had to get rid of our bombs. So we dropped them. We didn't know we were going to get home until we got over the channel. And we were flying very low. And we were being shot at, you know, quite often. But on the 17th of August, the bad weather further delayed takeoff for the first bombardment wing. Their target was Schweinfurt, but rather than entering German airspace with the Regensburg strike force as planned, they were hours behind, allowing the Luftwaffe's best to land, rearm, and intercept them, now with about 300 fighters. Jordy's been hit in feather number four. Cover more you can, everybody. There's another one working shorty over. Another one o'clock. Hi. On any mission, they also faced an equally dangerous threat, anti-aircraft fire, or flak. We were in the lead ship of the 60 airplane group, and they had me flying in the waist, and the flak was so heavy, I, I told on the, on the interphone, I said, and we're gonna, we're gonna catch it this time, <laughs> and we did. I looked out before we got to our target, and you could see the flak was so heavy up there, it looked like a big thunderhead. That was flak. I stowed my gun, and just as I turned, I heard it pop. I had been looking out the window right above it, and right where my head was was a hole about four inches in diameter. It would have taken my head off. On the 17th, the first bombardment wing lost 36 B-17s before starting their bomb run on the crucial Schweinfurt plants. These factories produced about half of the Nazis' ball bearing supply, vital parts for panzers and the Luftwaffe. When you're getting close to your target, you really can't take any evasive action. Your uh, bombardier using the uh, Norden bombsite is now controlling the airplane. He's flying it, and he has to fly it pretty much on a straight course. So there's about 30 seconds there where the gunners on the ground uh, have a chance to zero in on you because you can take no evasive action. The Schweinfurt survivors 
limped home, often struggling to stay airborne, arriving randomly at the nearest base as the ground crew scrambled their ambulances to treat the wounded and recover the dead. The crews heard that both targets had been hit hard. Production at Schweinfurt fell by over a third for several weeks. Most of the B-17s bore scars, bullet holes, broken engines, and busted tails. It was a miracle some of them returned. Many would never fly again. Scores were damaged. 60 were lost, along with about 660 men, nearly one in five. They had shot down 47 Nazi fighters that day. Suffering all those casualties was the major turning point. The Air Force had it proved to them that their idea of sending B-17s unescorted on a deep penetration just was not valid. More unsustainable losses came with a second huge raid on Schweinfurt in October 1943. Another 60 planes were lost and over 120 damaged. Unescorted raids deep into Germany were largely cancelled for months. When they used radar for blind bombing, only about 3% of bombs fell within 300 meters of their targets. At Schweinfurt, around 7% hit using an optical bomb site. When the bomb site was developed and put into American bombers, the claim was that it could drop a bomb in a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet. Uh, and maybe that's true if the pickle barrel was maybe five miles in diameter. The complex gyroscopic M4 Norden bomb site could not see through clouds or deal with bombers dodging flak or fighters. Straight bomb runs with targeting by veteran crews only made some limited improvements. Throughout the war, the Americans um, insisted on the efficacy of precision daylight bombing, even though the, the evidence for it really wasn't there. Losses of one in five were not sustainable and took a huge psychological toll on those who did return to base. Many of the air crew were very pessimistic about their chances of seeing the end of the war or making their 25 missions. If they made five missions, they were feeling that their, their luck was about to run out. Levels of alcoholism, nervous shakes, and undiagnosed trauma escalated. It was the pills that got a lot of the guys through, pills to put them to sleep, pills to keep them awake, pills to kill the depression. As a result of these immense combat strains, pilots and aircrew traditionally get all the glory. But they were useless without their mechanics and armorers. This airplane's got to fly in the morning. It's going to be ready. Uh, Major, I don't know, sir. Let's get the fans turning. Similarly, the B-17 steals all the glory from the many B-24 Liberators that also flew with the 8th as epitomized by one notable aircraft. 
Witchcraft was a, a B-24H Liberator, which was a very, very famous B-24 of the 8th Air Force in the, such the fact that it flew 130 missions. It suffered quite a bit of battle damage. Um, the ground crew was one of the best ground crews in the 8th Air Force. There was a, a Chinese, there was a Dutchman, an American. They actually called them the League of Nations because there were so many nationalities in that ground crew, but they were very uh, diligent and, and took great pride in looking after witchcraft. And it was their aircraft. Uh, they only lent it to the air crews. It was their aeroplane. But it would take a new aircraft to win air superiority. A sleek new fighter. As 1944 dawned, the Western Allies had one key priority, D-Day, the liberation of Nazi-occupied Europe. But success depended upon the eradication of the Luftwaffe. This is a must. Destroy the enemy air force wherever you find them, in the air, on the ground, and in factories. And the key to success was the disposable drop tank. Its extra fuel allowed new little friends to accompany the bombers deep into Germany. The P-51 Mustang had arrived. It proved to be the Holy Grail, a long-range fighter that could still beat Hitler's best at any altitude. And the miracle ingredient was adding the Spitfire's Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, which transformed an emu into an eagle. Over 15,000 Mustangs would eventually prove decisive. The P-51 Mustang was a game changer in World War II aerial warfare. As far as escorting the bombers to and from their targets, the P-51 was unbeatable. In late February 1944, the Allies planned a sustained, all-out attack. Big week. Its aim? To end the Luftwaffe's ability to defend Nazi airspace and win air superiority for D-Day. The 8th assembled over 800 heavy bombers and as many fighters, initially targeting the Messerschmitt plant near Leipzig. On the way out and escort you all the way home. This was going to be a combined bomber offensive by both the American 8th Air Force and the RAF Bomber Command. And the primary objective of this was to degrade as much as possible the German aircraft manufacturing industry. The heavy flight suits now came with electrical heating and a thermos of coffee. Before signal flares coordinated the launch of this massive air armada across Europe. Your bomb is 5,000 pounds. Gas load naturally, maximum. Don't start your engines before you have to. You'll need all the gas you have. The Eighth's offensive firepower grew with new generations of fighters. But sometimes old tech was the best way to keep things handy. The increasing flood of P-51 Mustangs joined the sleek twin-engine P-38 Lightnings. But the majority remained updated P-47s, all with the vital long-range drop tanks realized if they could target um, where the Germans were actually producing their fighters, their bombers, their ground attack aircraft, they could, they could deal a real killer blow to the Luftwaffe. And they could do this in particular by forcing them to face them in the sky. In one key innovation, the US fighters were now unleashed 
no longer just tied to the close protection of the bombers, ordered to hunt and kill, turning the tables on the Luftwaffe interceptors. He exploded when I was about 50 yards behind him with his tail and wings separating from the rest of the plane and went down spinning. We hit the first bunch in true Thunderbolt fashion, ripped through their scattering ranks and began to chop up the second echelon. I was determined I would go wherever he went do whatever he did. I wanted a victory. Tactics and technology combined as they now bounced the unsuspecting Luftwaffe, nailing 61 for the loss of just four on the first day. Hundreds of American bodies would lie scattered across the continent. But hundreds upon hundreds of jerry fighters would drop from the flaming skies to rest in ruin, as complete as that of many of the factories from which they came. Numerous industrial areas were hammered that week, forcing Hitler to divert more resources to defend them. Whereas, you know, the Americans could replace those losses, both in machine and men, the Germans simply couldn't. In total, the Nazis lost over 250 fighters in the air that week. But the 8th paid in blood, as about 20% of their heavies still fell from the skies. In the run-up to D-Day, these new tactics began to devastate the Luftwaffe as the prowling American fighters embraced more missions. Outlined by the 8th's new commander, Major General Jimmy Doolittle. It's desirable that we peel off as many fighters as possible to come down and strafe ground targets. Waves of strike fighters sought out targets of opportunity, particularly airfields packed with warplanes but also key pieces of infrastructure, roads and rail lines, loaded trains and bustling marshalling yards. Canal barges, oil tanks and flak towers. all vital to Nazi troop, tank, and munitions movements. And now, weakening Hitler's iron grip on occupied Europe. The introduction of the long-range P-51 Mustang fighter was essential to victory. The presence of the P-51s was really the thing that, that broke the Germans back in terms of being able to defend itself from the air. This was further proven in March 1944, when the 8th also started to raid Hitler's capital, Berlin. But somehow, the more the Americans bombed, the more the Nazis produced. By mid-1944, the mighty 8th numbered 200,000 people with over a 1,000 fighters and more than 2,000 heavy bombers. But death stalked them as soon as their engines started. It had the nickname of the Bell of Boston. Um, it was a bit of a war-weary old war horse. They lost an engine on takeoff just shortly leaving the end of the runway. The pilot, Lieutenant Kingsley, couldn't 
climb and he mushed along for about a mile and a half till he hit one big old English oak tree which ripped the wing off where it exploded and disintegrated. And of the 10 young men on board, six lives were taken and four survived. They were rescued from the crash site by my late father and my late grandfather with a neighbor. We have a burnt golf ball. The top of it is burnt. I actually found that on the crash site in amongst the bits and pieces of wreckage. And it was quite an unusual item to find. When they were waiting for mission takeoff, they had time to pass. Lieutenant Arthur Doyle's little thing he used to do was he had a bag of golf balls and he would drive golf balls down the perimeter track to pass the time. And obviously one of two were left in the aircraft and this was one of Lieutenant Doyle's golf balls. Most operations now focused on preparations for D-Day in June. The 8th had to hit vast areas of France to help disguise the true location of the landings and destroy the Nazis' infrastructure. We were flying almost every day, dropping bombs in there, trying to uh, eliminate opposition for the landing. We flew up the coast of France and, and the, to our target. That was the greatest sight I've ever seen. The air was full of aircraft of all descriptions. Every boat that would move was in that channel, taking troops across. On D-Day itself, they failed to destroy the Normandy beach defenses, but had achieved a great victory. The Luftwaffe hardly appeared. The Allies had finally won air superiority over the battlefield. Their record against the Nazi economy is far more mixed, as aircraft production actually grew until September 1944. But without the bombing, it would have increased far more and freed up the Luftwaffe and anti-aircraft artillery for the front lines. The bombing campaign was quite effective against industrial targets. Uh, the Germans were forced to disperse their manufacturing facilities. Uh, a lot of the German armaments production went underground. And they also destroyed another vital part of the Nazi war machine, oil production, now artificially squeezed from coal in huge refineries. Its ability to drive a modern mechanized war machine was reliant on the, the supply of the black stuff. And when the 8th Air Force hit these refineries in a very short period of time, the shortages of fuel for the German war machine were crippling. The mighty 8th has been criticized for causing civilian casualties as they increasingly bombed German cities, often with incendiaries. But they did make a decisive contribution to the Allied victory, destroying the Luftwaffe and much Nazi infrastructure, and paid an appalling price, with 26,000 dead an extraordinary loss of aircrew. Over a thousand more fatalities than the far bigger US Marine Corps suffered in the whole Pacific campaign. Which is incredible if you think about the ferocity of the fighting um, in the Pacific, at Tarawa, Saipan, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and yet here were air crews in a supposedly safer um, sphere of fighting in the air war, suffering more. In the end, air power had proven to be Hitler's critical weakness and the Allies' greatest strength. Where technology, industry and sacrifice combined to ensure victory over the Nazis.
the life that the air crews had to go through and endure was some of the most harrowing of any uh, combat soldier in World War II.